All right. Good uh, evening, everybody, and welcome to the January 28th um, City Council Redevelopment Agency meeting of San Carlos. Um, we'll hereby call the meeting uh, to order, and um, we will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Everybody, please stand. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic of the United States, one nation, Uh, all right, are there any changes to the order of the agenda from council or staff or the public? Any requests? Mr. Mayor, I think the only change was that we are going to adjourn to closed session after this. Great, thank you. That is true. We did not finish our business in closed session, so we'll adjourn to closed session at the conclusion of the public meeting. Um, and with that, we'll go to council communications and announcements, item number three. I start down here on my right with Council Member Amat. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, earlier last week, uh, Randy Royce and I had the privilege of uh, recognizing uh, two police officers. Uh, Officer Scott King received the Police Chief's Coin Award, and uh, PST uh, Celine Valdez was awarded the medal for her uh, rather impressive actions in saving a gentleman's life. and. Uh, Council passed a proclamation recognizing her heroism and her and her activities, and we were just proud to have her there. Great, thank you very much, Councilmember Goka. And no, no. Councilmember two, Royce. Two quick items. There were two uh, very nice affairs in the last week and a half. Mm. Uh, the Lions Club had their crab feed. Uh, uh, with all the crab as you could eat, I think there was a few hundred pounds that were ordered, and then uh, we had a carnival put on by Rotary just last night. So, uh, and I believe Qantas has something coming up in March. So, uh, a lot of lot of activity going on in town. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Vice Mayor Grisilli. Nothing today, Mr. Mayor. Good. And I just wanted to uh, point out to everybody we're in the midst of San Carlos Week of the Family. Um, yesterday we had a rip roaring screening of. Uh, of a film um, that was a uh, very entertaining film, and we did that at... Uh, Out of tea. Hey. <laughs> I don't... Yeah, call me crazy. I don't know how we figured that one out. Uh, <laughs> but, but we had a great time and uh, handed out some little uh, tchotchkes to those of you that missed it. Hey, oh, well. Um, and then tonight is family activity night, so I'm sure that all the families of St. Carlos are gathered around the television, the, those that aren't here, and are watching the meeting tonight. So... Welcome to all the families that are watching the, the council meeting tonight. Um, on Tuesday, there's the family puppet show at 7 p.m. at the library on the second floor. Wednesday is Hiller Flight Night at 4.30 p.m. at the Hiller Avi uh, Aviation Museum. And there's a family jazz concert on Thursday, the 31st at 7 p.m. So at Central Middle School. These are all, you know, activities are designed to, to get family together and, and uh, gather around and do some things together communally. So I hope everybody... We'll uh, try to attend and, and, and bring your family. With that, we'll move on to item number four, which is council appointments and presentations. Um, and Brian Mora, our assistant city manager, will uh, introduce this item for us. Thank you, Mayor and members of council. Uh, as the council uh, may be aware, uh, last summer the city of San Carlos was one of six cities invited to be part of a pilot of the Bay Area Green Business Program. This program has been in existence for 10 years now. It was started in Alameda County uh, and San Mateo County and Sonoma County are the last of the nine counties to join. Um, we were uh, invited at uh, the request of Supervisor uh, Mark Church, who is here tonight, and I thought what we would do is have Supervisor Church tell you a little bit about the program that the county has sponsored. Uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit afterwards about uh, where we are in the program. And then I'd like to invite both Mayor Lewis and Supervisor Church to present the first five green certified awards to five of our businesses that have been so recognized. So, Supervisor Church. Well, thank you very much, Brian, uh, Mr. Mayor, and uh, members of the council. It's a pleasure to be here this evening, and I want to thank you for uh, inviting me to uh, tonight's uh, council meeting. Um, as Brian indicated, I'm here to 
share some of the uh, success of our Green Business Pilot Program. Uh, the uh, county launched the program uh, last July of uh, 2007, and uh, with, uh, as Brian indicated, six partner cities, and San Carlos, uh, of course, is one of those cities. The uh, purpose of the uh, program is to encourage small and medium-sized local businesses to engage in uh, environmentally friendly uh, uh, business practices that would prevent pollution and uh, conserve resources. And uh, we targeted four business sectors, uh, restaurants, auto repair shops, uh, hotels, and retail stores, and of course uh, governmental agencies are also encouraged to participate. Uh, it really has been a win-win for all the parties. Uh, the businesses uh, ultimately uh, benefit by reducing their operating costs uh, and by receiving uh, free advertising and marketing through ABAG and, and of course, uh, most importantly, the environment benefits. And uh, this really is part of our collective effort to reduce our carbon footprint uh, throughout the county. Uh, the program is successful uh, because of partners like you. Uh, this council provided the leadership to join the pilot program, and uh, we are very, very grateful for your participation. And uh, I want to take a moment to recognize and uh, thank uh, Brian Mora. Uh, he is, uh, as you know, the coordinator for the city, and he has brought with him a uh, high level of enthusiasm to all the meetings, which we very much appreciate. Uh, as your staff report indicates, uh, so far a, a total of 17 businesses countywide have been certified. Uh, many more businesses uh, are in the process and will be certified in the future. Uh, you will be pleased to know uh, that of all the cities participating, uh, San Carlos came in first uh, with five businesses being certified. So you and your residents can take a, a great deal of pride uh, in knowing that this city is taking the lead and is setting an excellent example for all the other cities to follow. Uh, this is truly a community that is environmentally aware and understands the importance of this effort. So I'm glad to be here, and uh, the county is uh, happy to participate with you as partners in this important effort, and uh, uh, thank you for including me in this recognition of your local businesses. Well, on behalf of the council, I want to thank you for being here tonight. Um, it's an honor to have you here, and I know it means a lot to the businesses that are also getting the award tonight. And uh, thanks for starting the program, and uh, it's something that we all look forward to continuing a uh, continuing effort in San Carlos, and, and we love being first. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Ward, did you have some additional comments? Let me make a couple more comments before we uh, bring up the five businesses. First of all, uh, I wanted to give the council a brief overview of what's involved. Uh, this is not a trivial undertaking that the five businesses that you were to meet tonight have taken. That uh, involves a 11 page self assessment. It involves uh, the businesses uh, upgrading, in some cases, their lighting and their uh, water uh, uh, fixtures and some of their other uh, recycling practices. Uh, in some cases, some cost was involved. Uh, and then there were certifications by organizations such as the SBWMA and PG&E, CalWater, the Bay Area Air Board, and the County Health Department. So it's a fairly extensive program. Um, as far as where we are, as Supervisor Church indicated tonight, you will recognize the first five businesses that are certified. I'm pleased to tell you, though, that there are nine more businesses behind them that are now in the inspection phase. Uh, and it's my plan to bring those businesses to you in the next couple months as they complete this process. And then uh, it is my intent uh, this week or next to then open up the process to the next round of businesses. We had 20 businesses start in this round, and I suspect that when we do advertise further, we will probably have additional businesses that uh, want to participate. So uh, with that, let me ask uh, the mayor and Supervisor Church to uh, join us at the awards uh, desk here. We have awards tonight from uh, uh, Assemblymember Ira Ruskin, uh, the county, and also the mayor. And what I'd like to do is introduce to the council and the community the businesses in the order that they were certified. Um, and the first uh, green business in San Carlos is the San Carlos Youth Center. Uh, and the key players here were Jerry Fujimoto, our recreation supervisor, and Pat Thomas, and the building maintenance supervisor at the city. So Jerry and Pat. Oh, 
Uh, well, this is our uh, certificate of uh, compliance uh, with the uh, the Green Business Program, and it's awarded to San Carlos Youth Center. And it reads, uh, has successfully met the criteria for certification by the San Mateo County Green Business uh, Program. Therefore, the certificate issued is issued this eighth day of November, uh, 2007, for outstanding efforts to reduce pollution and solid waste and conserve water, energy, and other natural resources. Congratulations to all of you. you. Uh, we also have a proclamation uh, on behalf of the, the city, um, which, again, because we've read some of the criteria tonight, I, I won't go through to read the whereas is right now, but it's a certificate from the city as well and a proclamation, as well as for the, from the California legislature, the uh, state assembly. Uh, in honor of your commitment to protect the environment by operating your business in an environment, environmentally friendly manner and for your certification as a San Carlos certified green business. And again, we thank you for your effort. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Okay, our next uh, certified green business is Melanie's Fine Foods. And uh, to accept the award is the owner, Melanie Yunk. These uh, certificates read the same, so I won't reread them, but uh, uh, this is awarded to you, Certificate of Compliance from the County. Congratulations. Thank you. And again, a proclamation for Melanie's Fine Foods is one of San Carlos's first certified green businesses, a proclamation from the city, and also a nice certification and um, um, a beautiful certificate from the State Assembly. Congratulations. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay, our third uh, certified green business in San Carlos is Emerson Environmental. And to accept this uh, recognition is Suzanne Emerson, the owner of Emerson Environmental. Su Suzanne, uh, on behalf of the county, congratulations. Uh, the certificate is issued to Emerson Environmental LLC. Congratulations. Thank you. I think we'll throw a different twist on each one of these. What the heck? Uh, San Carlos hereby proclaims Emerson Environmental as one of San Carlos's first five certified green businesses. And congratulations from the State Assembly as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our fourth uh, certified green business is A Plus Japanese Auto Repair. And owner Eric Sevam is here to accept the award. Eric, uh, on behalf of the county, we commend and congratulate you on being one of the first uh, businesses to be certified uh, A-plus Japanese auto repair. Congratulations. Here's another paragraph on the proclamation. Whereas A-plus Japanese automotive repair has successfully completed the extensive green business checklist review and certification process and is now a certified green business operating in the city of San Carlos, we appreciate your effort. Thank you very much. Okay, and our fifth and final uh, business tonight with the Green Business Award is REI San Carlos, and the contact there is David Noble, the assistant store manager. Again, REI, we uh, congratulate you. We thank you for your participation, and uh, uh, we present you with this uh, certificate of compliance on behalf of the county. Congratulations. And again, thanks to REI. And, you know, we have a wide variety of different types of businesses that have participated tonight, and we appreciate uh, one of the larger businesses getting behind this effort and uh, whatever individual efforts it took from this particular branch. We really appreciate it. Here's your certificate from the State Assembly as well from the city. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. And uh, again, on behalf of the city, I want to thank Supervisor Mark Church for starting the program, for being here tonight. Uh, warm St. Carlos, thank you. And, all right. Have a nice evening.
right, that brings us to item 4B, which is consideration of reappointing Harold Shoot, I think I pronounced that correctly, and Robert Farkas to the Economic Development Advisory Commission for a three-year term ending, ending January 30th, 2011. Mr. Mayor, I can handle that one. Thank you. Um, Christine Boland, City Clerk. Um, as you know, um, Commission members can serve three three-year terms for no more than a total of nine years. Uh, these two gentlemen are eligible t for reappointment on the Economic Development Commission if you so choose to reappoint them. Um, there's some details outlined in your staff report and some alternatives, so you can go ahead and consider that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam City Clerk. Any comments or motion from Council? I'd like to make a motion to uh, appoint uh, the two gentlemen to the Economic Development Advisory Commission for the three-year term ended January 30, 2011, Harold Shute and uh, Robert Farkas. Second. Um, roll call, please, Christine. Councilmember Ahmad? Yes. Councilmember Grisilli? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? Yes. Councilmember Royce? Yes. Mayor Lewis? Yes. And that brings us to item number five, which is public comment. Um, this is each person uh, person's wishing to address the City Council on matters not on the posted agenda may do so now and uh, for a time limit of two minutes uh, per person and I have a couple of speaker slips number one is from Pat Bell Pat Bell, San Carlos. Um, I would like to encourage the public to sign up to get the uh, council newsletter, which comes out every two weeks and is full of good information. It took me months and months and months and months to get this, uh, them to send me this, what is legally public information, but I got it. So that's done. Everybody else should have an easy time. They won't email it, so you have to pay 25 cents a page. But when a police officer does something spectacular, it goes in your newsletter. That's the only place I ever hear about things like that. And it tells you what's going on in each department, you know, parks and rec, administration, whatever. You guys know what's in it. I think the public should know what's in it. And sometimes it's really long. It might cost you a couple of bucks, but it's not expensive and it's really worth it. Maybe this council will uh, encourage staff, staff to share. And I completely support what Pat Potter is about to say. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And next we have Pat Potter. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Pat Potter, and I live at 135 Manor Drive, San Carlos. I'm here on behalf of San Carlos Green, which is a citizens task force that is working to make San Carlos a greener community. Allied Waste, our local waste hauler, has submitted a proposal to upgrade our current biweekly yard waste pickup to a weekly yard waste and food scrap pickup. We want to urge City Council to approve this proposal. We want San Carlos residents to have the opportunity to compost their food waste rather than burying it in a landfill. There are several strong arguments to support a weekly pickup of yard and food food waste scraps. First is that instead of being dumped in the landfill, this la uh, waste will be composted and used by the community. Second is that the methane gas that is created by organics in the landf landfill is 21 times more potent than carbon dioxide as greenhouse, uh, carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. Third, the state mandated that San Carlos divert 50 percent of its waste by a year 2000. We haven't gotten there yet, and it's 2008. And the city runs the risk of being fined by the state for failing to meet this requirement. With the likely passage of SB 1020, the required diversion rate will increase to 60 percent by 20, 2012 and 75 percent by 2020. Fourth, once residents get used to recycling their food scraps, many may want to start home composting. This would not only divert waste from landfill, but also improve the soil and the environment of San Carlos. There is no way we're going to meet the state's requirements without diverting organic waste from the landfill. I urge you, as does San Carlos Green, 
to accept Allied's proposal so we can start recycling our yard and food scraps every week. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Through the chair, I'd just like to comment that uh, the city has requested that the SBW may study the cost impact of Allied's proposal and uh, the difference between what it would cost to do the program now or to wait till 2011 when it's part of that. Uh, we anticipate that if we were to move ahead, it would have a, uh, the impact of raising garbage rates. So for your info. Thank you very much. We'll look forward to that report. Uh, with that, with no more public comment, any other public comment tonight? Um, we will move on to item number six. We'll close public comment. Um, and it's the approval of the consent calendar. Consent calendar items are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion on these items unless members of the council, staff, or public request, request specific items to be removed for separate action. Do I have a motion? Mr. Mayor, I make a motion to approve items uh, 6 A, B, C, D, E, and F. I'll second that. There's an F. Uh, we'll, uh, on the amended agenda, they added item F. There's an F. Just moved out. You didn't get the amended agenda. We have a first and a second. Is there any discussion? Uh, excuse me. Uh, I would like to pull item F. I didn't realize it was put on the consent calendar. Okay. So we have a request to remove item F. Uh, do we have an amend amendment to the uh, motion? I make my motion to approve items A, B, C, D, and E. And second. If there's no further discussion, roll call, please, Christine. Councilmember Ahmad? Yes. Councilmember Grassilli? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? Yes. Councilmember Royce? Yes. Mayor Lewis? Yes. So item 6F will come at the end of our council, but prior to the redevelopment agency, is that right, um, on the agenda? Typically, we move it to the end of the city council meeting. And prior to, so would that be prior to the redevelopment no, agency meeting no. tonight? That's what I'm yeah. trying to figure out. Let's not do it that way. I mean, typically, uh, because the council wears both hats as the agency and as the city council, yes. uh, we will oftentimes have redevelopment agency items in the middle of the agenda. So uh, we just typically have moved these to the end of the full agenda, including the redevelopment agency. Very good. So we'll discuss. Not closed session. Not, not no. closed session. No. So we will um, talk about it after item 10A tonight. We'll mm -hmm. talk about item 6F. If that is amenable to everybody on council, great. We will move on on to reports to council. Item number seven: presentation on Youth Advisory Council's 40th, excuse me, 40 Youth Developmental Assets. Mayor Lewis and members of the City Council. It's my pleasure to give the introductory comments uh, for this report. I think that we've all known people when we were growing up that uh, came from tough backgrounds, tough family lives, neighborhoods, whatever, and grew up to be a star. We probably, many of us have known people who grew up with all the supposed advantages and grew up not to be a star, to be polite. Uh, the 40 Youth Development Assets was developed out of this question. About 20 years ago, the Search Institute out of Minnesota, asked this question and decided to do the proper research. They did a 12-year longitudinal study, and they determined that there were 40 youth developmental assets, and the more of these that a young person had, the better chance they had to grow up into a healthy, caring, competent adult. Parks and Recreation was particularly interested in this approach to youth development because we try and focus on outcomes. That is, what impact are we having on people's lives versus how many activities we're running matches perfectly with our mission to foster human development. We found that there are documented outcomes that the more of these 40 assets a young person has, the use of alcohol decreases, drug use decreases, sexual activity decreases, and violence decreases. At the same time, academic performance increases, as does maintaining good health, valuing diversity, and delaying gratification. With that in mind, we reached out to the entire community in 2001 and had a true community collaborative to implement the assets across the com uh, community. As you look at those assets, and you have a brochure in front of you tonight, some of those uh, we can address here uh, through the youth development program, through the city uh, functions. Some are religious institution-based, some are schools, some are neighborhoods, some are family. So we pulled everybody together. We had uh, the schools represented, the Chamber of Commerce, the police, 
scouts, service clubs, preschools, and any number of organizations in town. Again, it uh, represents our mission to facilitate community problem solving. What we did at the youth center was we took a matrix. We had the 40 developmental assets down one side and all the programs we did across the top. And we just earmarked, okay, which programs were developing which of those 40 assets. And as I don't think you'll be surprised to hear, we found that some programs, some assets had a lot of resources given to them. And some assets that we really wanted to develop, like value and cultural diversity, had none. So what we did, without increasing our resources, we reallocated our resources in youth development to address even more of these assets. And we have found that, again, we are helping young people grow up into healthy, caring, competent adults with improved grades and less alcohol use and the other uh, symptoms that I talked about. The real report tonight is going to come from our youth development staff and then from uh, your uh, youth advisory council that you appoint each year. So at this point, I would like to introduce Jerry Fujimoto, who is the youth development supervisor for the city, and she will introduce the members of the youth advisory council. Jerry? Good evening. Now's the fun part. You get to listen to the kids. Um, first of all, I'm going to introduce, um, I'd like to recognize our, our Youth Advisory Council members that are sitting in the audience, um, our youth that are in middle school and high school that sit on our council that um, volunteer their time for their community. Council members, please stand. These students work very hard for their community. You may be seated. And they're very obedient at times. Um, they're still teenagers. Uh, this evening we have two of our young people will be um, presenting to you about our, our um, programs that we've created for the 40, 40 developmental youth assets. First of all, we have Matt Taylor, who is the chair of our Youth Advisory Council this year. And Matt has is been six years on our youth council, and he's a senior at Carlmont High School. He started when he was in the sixth grade. Uh, he, actually 10 years old. 10? Yeah, 10. And um, Matt contributes to his community in multiple ways as a volunteer for various organizations. Anthony Vasallo, come on up, boys, is a voting member of our Youth Advisory Council, and he's a second year um, member of the council, and he's a junior at Sarah High School, and he's our suit man. Anthony is a mentor and tutor for second to ninth grade students and has been recognized by Senator Leland Yee, Congresswoman Anna Eshoo, Senator Joseph Sanidian, Assembly Member Ira Ruskin, and U.S. Court of Appeals Justice Barry Silverman for academic achievement. And he wants to go into surprise law. Um, so both of them will be um, presenting to you this evening uh, about the 40 developmental youth assets. Good evening. Um, on behalf of the Youth Advisory Council, once again, I'm Anthony Vasolo. We'd like to thank City Council for the opportunity to speak to you guys once again tonight. Um, our focus tonight are um, the developmental assets of our youth and how we would like to further those, improve, and um, to give you an overall report of our progress as of now. Um, basically, the point of the assets is where do we want our youth to go? How do we want them to mature into young, successful adults? And how can we provide them with the tools necessary? And we have concluded um, through surveys and much research that the best way is to address specific assets. So we've developed the 40 developmental assets. And in most ways, always actually, they are beneficial. We can protect the youth from potential dangers and we can provide them with the necessary, um, with things we have in our community or whoever else can help individuals, families with what they need to succeed. And this does not only address people from certain neighborhoods or cultural backgrounds, but all youth of our society. 
Um, as I previously said, this includes everyone. So we do need the continued support of family, schools, church organizations, coaches, essentially everyone in a young person's life in order for our asset approach to succeed. Now, we have developed our assets into two main categories, being external and internal. The external assets focus mostly around what we provide for our youth, being, for example, um, constructive use of time. What can we tell our youth to do? How can we positive influence, positively influence them? Now, the internal assets are more self-motivated. Where does the individual want to go, and what else can we provide for the individual to succeed in the way he or she desires? Here we have some statistics for you. Um, one to ten of the assets, you can see we have a very high use of drugs, um, sexual activities, and violence. And with more assets comes less of all that. So if we provide all these assets with, in San Carlos, in our community, then our youth can stay away from these problems that are persistent. Now, on the other hand, with the more assets comes more success in school. Our youth usually have more of a will to succeed academically and to be disciplined with their schoolwork. Their health overall increases because of their education, the facilities we provide, and they are more open to cultural diversity. Now, less of the assets usually comes down to the education and what our community provides. So the more the assets, the more successful the individual usually becomes. Now, academically, we have an increased high school completion and just overall academic success. And with these assets, our youth is less likely to become involved in negative activities that really leads into their adulthood and are really hard habits to break. And with more assets comes just overall success. And you can see some of the examples here. Now, we took a survey of our youth recently. And as you can see some of the stats here, um, this is what the youth thought that they had available to them. And as you can see, these are um, the social matters. And our youth, 50% of them felt that um, cultural competence was a positive thing, but on the other hand, we have 50% that says that's an issue. So it's one out of two. So things like that we can address. Now, a lot of our youth said they had a sense of purpose, which is great because they do have the want to succeed, but it is our job to help them and give them the um, tools necessary to achieve what they'd like. Here we have community relationships, and in a sense, this is kind of disappointing because the majority of our youth feel that, we, that they are not included in resources. They also feel that they are not valued. Now, this is not all, but this is a good majority. So things like this we can address, and maybe we can provide more opportunities for our youth to feel like they are part of our community and that they are wanted. Um, also, constructive use of time. Um, for the most part here, we are quite successful, and these um, young children feel that they have the tools necessary um, except for involvement with creative activities, we have kind of a drop there. So as you can see, there are specific things that we need to address and specific things that we do need to maintain that are already successful. Now, the asset building approach, it really is about a bunch of things. It's about our community. It's about um, us addressing everyone. We have to provide programs. We have to have individuals. We have to have everyone come together and work and provide um, what is necessary for everyone to succeed. And I know it's something that I keep bringing up, but it really is the truth and it is really imperative that we have everything for, this, for these youth. The assets, as elementary as it sounds, the, the difference between 30 assets and 31 may not be that much, but back to the graph, you can see that there is, a, there is an increase in violence and we have all these different problems. So if we continue to um, help our youth, success comes along. Now, who is involved? Luckily, we have a lot of our San Carlos organizations involved with um, helping us develop the 40 youth assets. Um, you guys, we thank you once again, the City Council, for helping us, one of the many organizations, and thanks to all these organizations who continue to help us as well. And as you can see, these are quite diverse. This ranges from everyone in a child's life, from coaches 
to um, ministers, to city council members, to anyone else who they are involved with influences them one way or another. Now we have this um, program called Young Consumer Champions where we recognize businesses that have been very um, youth friendly. Actually most recently we have been passing out more recent decals that these businesses can place in their windows. So youth when they're downtown or near that business they can see hey you know what they appreciate me maybe I should patronize them and these businesses have to be nominated and um, they go through a process and we have been doing we've been trying to get this um, young consumer champions we've been trying to give it a little bit more attention we started with the decals but our main goal is to show the youth that they are welcomed by these certain businesses and now I'd like to turn this part of the presentation over to Chairman Matt Taylor. Hello. Um, I just want to thank you once again for your big involvement in helping us uh, deliver these assets to our youth in our community. Um, this is Speedery and Foodville, some of the winners of the program Anthony was talking about, the YCC. Um, next I'd like to talk about is one of the assets that was low was Reading for Pleasure and how we are upping that. Um, the short story contest through the homework lab at the youth center. Um, so our staff put together and they sent out flyers telling um, the basis of the short story contest to the schools and we've gotten tons and tons of responses from three pages to 25 pages to 15 pages in very in-depth detail. Um, we also do school literacy program through the schools. Um, another program that we do to up the youth um, being valued in our community as we do Youth Vote, Youth Voice. Um, we had 500 youth come to the Youth Center in 2004 to vote on the presidential election and all the propositions and everything that was going on in the community and across the nation. Um, this helps the youth learn the election process that they're going to have to go through in a couple of years. And it um, gives them a reason to vote. It uh, makes them knowledgeable on their um, candidates for the president and all the propositions. This is former Mayor Tom Davis with one of our participants in the Youth Vote Youth Voice. And this is when we posted the results. We had a crowd of kids come to see how it turned out and surprisingly um, San Carlos is a rather democratic city. All the votes went to the Democrats and all the votes for the propositions went to where the Democrats choose to go. So. Very interesting. <laughs> Another thing we do is um, com commission liaisons, where we have nine voting members on council, and each one of them is uh, designated a different commission throughout the city, from arts and culture to parks and recreation to the vast majority of them. So we have them sit. It allows them to put their voice in on issues that are going on in the city. It allows you, the council members, and other commission members to notice them and use them as a resource. Another thing we do is through our athletic department, we require all of our coaches, our parents, to have contracts. Because before that, we had parents on the field fighting with the coaches, fighting with the refs, yelling. Not a very positive environment for kids to develop. So we had parents um, and the coaches sign contracts saying that they will be encouraging, they will be um, supportive, they'll create a supportive environment for our children of the community and allow the coaches to, the, to, to do their job and the refs to do theirs and make it very, very developmental for our youth. Youth in Government Day. Um, youth in Government Day is a program we do every other year. Um, it's usually directed for our council members to get involved in the government, to see how it runs. And what we do is we bring them to uh, City Hall and we divide them into groups and any spaces that are not filled by our council we fill with eighth graders from the two middle schools here in uh, San Carlos. And we let them come in and take tours and meet all the heads of the different departments and City Council comes in and you guys talk to them and it just allows the um, allows youth to see what they're going to inherit in a couple of years because when they grow up they're going to inherit this and they want to see how it's run and how everything's done. So, And this is a picture of the kids in the planning department and that is one of the heads of the department and she's going through with them actually sitting down talking to them one-on-one -on -one. if they have any questions they'll answer them. And it's very, I've done it twice and it's a very enriched 
enrichening program for the youth to go through. Youth Center programs. The Youth Center is the hub of how we are reaching out to the youth of our community to use these assets, to implement these assets, and there are many programs that we do. Is Our Health and Wellness is a statewide recognized program. We've got many awards for it. Um, we do the nutrition program where we, we've had nutritionists come in and talk to the kids about creating a better eating lifestyle, a more healthy lifestyle. We've had um, we've had some trainers come in and do some fun stuff with the kids in the gym, get their blood flowing and have them running around, jumping, rolling, an amazing amount of things that kids weren't doing before. And we've changed all of our snacks at the youth center to healthy snacks. Before, we weren't doing the best, but now we're getting the kids to eat salads, we're getting the kids to eat vegetables, some things that I wouldn't have touched when I was that age, but now they're eating them up like crazy. And then we've done a couple things. We've done um, Walk Across America is where we have the kids do laps in our gym. We're, we'll walk around the park, and we've done so many laps that we've gotten from San Francisco all the way to Washington, D.C. That was, that was a big one. That was a lot of fun, and the kids enjoyed that one. Uh, Tony with Tori, where we have her come in and instruct um, the kids on how to do a bunch of fun different things. allows the kids to have a positive mentor in their life, more fitness challenges, Salads. Kids are now enjoying salads, which is an amazing thing. They're lining up the kitchen door to order one, and they love it. And it allows the staff to do positive role modeling for the kids. If we're eating salads, and they're eating salads. If we're eating junk food, they're like, oh, they're eating junk food, so we should. So we don't do that. Um, so positive role modeling. Caring mentors. The um, staff at the youth center are positive mentors on the kids' lives. They are doing majority of what the assets are trying to role model and show the kids to be successful when they get older. So, positive mentors at the youth center. Kids can have constructive use of time. It allows the kids to come in. These are fifth graders all the way down to kindergartners to come in and each program, each night, kids night out is centered around a theme, which is a more educational theme, which might be different cultures, wildlife, it might be cars, just stuff to get their their mind juice is flowing and let them think, but also having fun at the same exact time. Nutritional programs, more stuff like I said, we have nutritionists come in, the kids have fun with it, and it's a great thing to see that the kids are actually, whoa, healthy food is good, it tastes good, and might as well take that over picking up a Twinkie, so. Dance Dance Revolution, making something that people see as a problem uh, to, with an unhealthy lifestyle more positive way for our kids to use their time and making better decision skills. My, let's get up and play Dance Dance Revolution where I'm jumping around, moving around, sweating, besides sitting down playing a sit down video game that gets them nowhere, really. YAC dances. This is what we do once a month. Um, and it allows the kids to come in to the youth center, about 400 of them a month. And it allows them to have a safe place to go on a Friday night so we know where they are. They're doing constructive use of time. They're having friends with their peer, having fun with their peers. Sorry, and they're doing, um, they're having a lot of fun. And we know where they are, and we know that they're safe and not out on the streets doing negative things. Safe and secure environment. There is some of the kids enjoying a slow song. <laughs> San, uh, the San Carlos Youth Center Homework Lab. It engages the kids actively in their learning and also lets us help them. We have uh, at least we try to have one staff in there all the time so the rules are the same and they get to know the kids and they get to know which kids actually do their homework, which kids might kind of dodge the homework center and we go out there and try to get them in there to do the homework. So and we have all the textbooks from the school so there's no excuse I left my textbook at home. Um, so we have, it's a positive place to do your homework and it's a lot of fun. We have little facts all around the room and it's a lot of fun. It's a great way to engage the kids in their learning. The Agro Club, um, making good decisions on how to positively impact the environment in their community. We grow organic vegetables and fruits out in our uh, out in our garden at the youth center. It's off on the side right there, and we actually we plant them in the spring and then we harvest, and then we actually use those in our snack program. So it's a great way for the kids to see that they can utilize their environment around them and make healthy choices at the same time. And this, I'm going to turn this back over to Mr. Rosala. 
So as you can see, we do have a lot of programs that we are um, utilizing to address the assets and improve them and provide them for the San Carlos youth. Now for the future, we need to maintain and increase assets that need attention. For example, as you can see in the survey, some things are 28 percent, 33. Those things we can address. We need to partner with other people and we ask for the continued support of the organizations already helping us. Um, City Council, thank you once again for working with us. Um, you guys are great role models and we ask you to keep that up <laughs> for our youth. Um, spread the word please because the assets, if everyone is working together then it will be more and more difficult for our youth to slip through the cracks. Um, and if you have any opportunities to increase assets or have any ideas at all, feel free to contact us and let us know and we can work with you. And as Gandhi must said, we must be the change we wish to see in the world. Role modeling is essential and we must work and we can't leave these kids to be independent, overly independent. We need to provide our assets for them. We need to help them grow into who we, th we want them to be and they will inherit what we are working with today. So it's up to us. Thank you for your time once again. Great. Thank you very much for that nice presentation. Does, uh, do any council members have any questions for either Anthony or Matt? Questions or comments? No. Well, thank you very much. I know that, um, and, and uh, uh, Director Weiss, we appreciate um, how much work you guys, a lot of volunteer hours. I know the Youth Advisory uh, Council, you know, I read the minutes, and I know that you guys work hard at this stuff. So we, we really appreciate as a council. I mean, we're only as good as our youth is active in the community. So we thank you very much for taking it. Um, so responsibly in doing what you do. Uh, Matt, as many years of your tenure on this, appreciate all that effort. I know that's a, that's a lot of work. Um, but you and Anthony have done a great presentation tonight. And um, the assets, you know, I was fortunate when I was on the Park and Rec Commission to take part in part of the process of the, this sort of analysis. It truly is a great tool and um, they're great questions that we should be asking ourselves as a community and we continue to. So thank you very much for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Seven. We're on to item number eight at this point, and it's a public hearing. Uh, item 8A, consideration of abandoning a five-foot strip of public right-of-way along the northwesterly side of the 100 block of the 100 block of Colton Avenue. Good evening, uh, Honorable Mayor and Council Member. Uh, my name is Henry Louis. I'm the Assistant uh, Public Director. Uh, let me give you some background on this item. Um, on October uh, 19, uh, 2007, Mr. and Ms. Webbs, the property owner, located 124 Colton Avenue, have requested the abandonment of this five-foot strip of public right-of-ways to provide them with adequate setback for their construction of their addition. Staff have completed uh, the review of their request and found that city does not have any plan for the use of this portion of right away except for the utility company. The staff has recommended city council order this abandonment of a five foot wide strip of the public right away along the northwesterly side of the 100 blocks of Colton Avenue and retains this portion of the public right away for public utility easement. Uh, this is conclude uh, my presentation. I'm happy to answer the questions. We can put up the maps. Thank you. Do we have any uh, questions? Or any questions or comments? Is there a motion? Uh, Mr. Mayor, this, Mr. Mayor, this is a public hearing. Public hearing. So we need oh, sorry. This public is hearing. a public hearing, so we need to uh, open the public hearing, Thank take you. any public Excuse comment. Me. We're uh, here to take public comments. I've been so corrected. Thank you for all the guidance. Um, <laughs> is there any public <laughs> comment on this uh, item? Mr. Mayor, make a motion to close the public hearing. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <coughs> With that, do we have any? Um, uh, Mr. Mayor, make a motion. Questions? I'm sorry. Any motions, comments, questions? If there's no questions, I'll uh, be happy to make a motion to uh, 
order the abandonment of a five-foot wide strip of public right-of-way along the northeasterly side of the 100 block of Colton Avenue by adopting resolution number... 2008-3. 2008-3. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, roll call, please, Christine. Councilmember Amon? Yes. Councilmember Grassilli? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? Yes. Councilmember Royce? Yes. Mayor Lewis? Yes. And I'd, on to item number 9A. It's consideration of adopting ordinance number 1396, amending the San Carlos Municipal Code. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right. Oh, pardon me. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Deborah Nelson, the planning manager, and back before you this evening with uh, the downtown ordinance for your discussion. The, um, as you remember, we have an urgency ordinance in place, which you extended for a year at your last meeting on the 14th, that applies. Uh, primarily to size of tenant spaces requiring use permits for spaces 2,500 square feet or larger and allows for um, like uses to continue and grocery to be exempt from that ordinance. So based on all the input we've had to date, um, the council, um, with your direction, you uh, had a first reading of an ordinance which incorporated the ideas of keeping the code flexible. Oh, I'm sorry. We went one further than I thought. Um, keeping the code fe flexible to respond to changing market forces, um, to focus on use without regard to size, to define retail but not to create a finite list, <coughs> to prohibit undesirable uses, and to incorporate community values. So we had a request since the last meeting for um, the staff to do a graphic for you, which is on your dais and also here on the table for the audience to pick up. Um, the detail of this, which is all of the specific uses that are either are permitted, prohibited, or conditional in the various uh, three zoning districts in the downtown before the ordinance, with the urgency ordinance as, an, as passed last week, um, are on those sheets before you. The features of which, in summary, are a definition of retail and downtown retail core and price point retail that was in your ordinance two weeks ago, a purpose statement for the CR and the CS. CR is basically Laurel Street. CS is the corners at El Camino and, and San Carlos Avenue. Uh, and to obtain permitted use language, permitted language for retail, which is very broad. Um, all retail uses except those specifically prohibited. The list is short, but you read it, the staff would read it with the definition of retail to determine what a retail use is and whether the proposal before us fits within that. Also, you uh, added um, v verbally at the staff suggestion uh, retail and consignment sale to the permitted uses, both in the CR, that's Laurel Street, and the CP, which is um, the north side of San Carlos Avenue where the Sam Trans building is, to uh, enhance the El Camino San Carlos Avenue, um, what, what I refer to as bookends, so that we address those not as we do the rest of El Camino, but say this is kind of an entry to your downtown. And uh, you retained antique sales as a conditional use. And I'll get into that a little bit. This may be an unintended consequence that you may wish to discuss. Um, I've done some research since your last meeting and found that um, in 1989, when the then council adopted the ordinance that prohibited um, resale and um, wholesale sale of used and blemished goods where we have added price point retail, there was a companion paragraph that said, except that antique stores and used artwork and used jewelry when it's a quality would be 
uh, under a conditional use. So um, as before you, um, we brought it without any change. Uh, Antique is still subject to a uh, conditional use permit. Um, you also amended a bunch of the prohibited uses for clarity to the code, just adding to some of the things that you've already prohibited but um, would help us a lot, like uh, uh, accessory sales for automobile and paint shops, wholesale sale on the ground floor. And then, the, of course, the big item for discussion was this price point retail, which you included in the prohibited uses. Um, more of that in the terms of clarity were things that were really sort of office and um, gathering places uses that haven't typically been permitted in a retail core, and so we added language with these additional uses, which you uh, read into your first ordinance, first reading. So um, as I mentioned about the unintended consequence um, of the N, being not able to represent to you last time that antiques were a um, conditional use permit, we would ask that option one, you reintroduce um, a replacement ordinance that has many of the same things you had before, but help us with a clarity on your intent for antique sales, whether to keep it in the conditional uses um, in all three of the districts, and that is a conditional use by the Planning Commission, or to move it to um, permitted by right. And as another option, based on some comment and questions we've had since the last meeting, you may wish to introduce a new ordinance for first reading, which makes other kinds of changes. So that concludes my report. Are there any uh, questions on the report for staff? Yes. Yes. So if we if we remove antique sales from being a conditional use, where do we stand on the reading of this ordinance? Because you'd be amending two sections that weren't included in at the last hearing. Uh, you would just be reintroducing uh, the ordinance with those two changes. Otherwise, it would be the same ordinance. So, and that would qualify then as a second reading, or would that then be a first reading? It would be a reintroduction of the ordinance and would bring it back on for a second reading. For a second reading. Great. Thank you. That's the only question I had. Any other questions for staff? Not questions, no. Okay. okay. Then I have public comment, and then we can have a discussion. So, um, public comment, I believe, on this item from Robert Siskin. Good evening, council members and staff. I'm Robert Siskin, owner of Siskin San Carlos Pharmacy for the past 22 years at 825 Laurel Street. I'm here to emphatically urge you to accept the second reading <coughs> of the replacement ordinance tonight as is. Have it take effect in 30 days, at which time the extended urgency ordinance dissolves. The replacement ordinance satisfies any and all concerns about conducting business in the downtown San Carlos. Continuing to fiddle with semantics of the ordinance and extending this process while Rome is burning is inconceivable. The San Carlos City Council's bailout, bailout of the inept property owners of the former Bell Market site with the emergency ordinance has resulted in severe collateral damage downtown. My business closure is a direct result of this extended vacancy, now approaching 16 months. Other businesses are on the brink and a virus of vacancies in the downtown must be avoided. The emergency ordinance has inflicted enough damage. Accept tonight's second reading and let's move forward. The Barnsleys have had sufficient acceptable suitors and months to negotiate, but to my knowledge, no new tenant has signed a lease for the property. 
I challenge this council tonight to focus all its power and urgency that it wielded in preventing the dollar store, the lease, to getting an acceptable tenant in place before ver further deleterious consequences result. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there any other uh, public comment on this item? Okay. Council members, comments? Council Mr. Mayor, uh, first I would like to thank uh, Deborah Nelson for uh, hunting down parts of the ordinance that were uh, pretty dusty. Uh, when this ordinance was introduced, uh, I had some confusion and asked uh, for the chart to be drawn out to specifically say what was in, what was out. Um, the issue that I had and that caused me to vote no in uh, in the introduction of this ordinance uh, was was specifically, and I would love to get some discussion on this, was around the the notion of the secondhand consignment and antique stores. Um, this is not just San Carlos. It's not just our redevelopment area. We're talking about the core area of our downtown. I may be singular in this respect to thinking that I don't walk down down Laurel Street and go, wow, we need more antique stores. And from my perspective, what we did with this ordinance was to basically say, any open space, come on in and open up an antique store as an accepted use. The and, and this is what I read. I, I went back to uh, the city attorney, and this may be unintended consequence. It may be the fact that this wouldn't actually occur, but why should we codify that? Uh, that was my, my real push, and that's why I'm pushing tonight to say, if I'm missing something, uh, why did we include as a specific and permitted use the consignment stores and the second-hand stores. So your preference would be to continue with as conditional use? Yes. Okay. From, from that perspective, I feel that, uh, you know, not saying absolutely no, but if this type of use is supposed to come in, I thought the genius that, uh, that EDAC had brought forward was to say, let's look at it from an economic perspective. Does this, you know, from the perspective of San Carlos, the redevelopment agency, and again, the core of our downtown. Does this bring economic vitality? And give us a look at it. That was what I felt comfortable with, but just to say, hey, blanket, no problem. You know, and the other thing that was somewhat interesting, and I asked Deborah about this, is do we have a definition of antique? Well, the fact is we don't. So I can take a whole bunch of used computer parts, slap the word antique. It's still going to require staff time to go out there, figure out what's going on, but in the meantime, we've we've got some vagueness. I I prefer let's be concrete. Let's not open up a back door. Let's let's take this language out and hopefully not have some unintended consequences, and move on with business. Thoughts or comments? The comment that I have is, uh, you know, I'm very much aware of, for for instance, that we have a uh, currently have a, an antique store in town that is a major retail space and there's a lot of customer activity that goes on in that retail store or that antique store. <clears throat> there's another store that's very small uh, at the other at the north end of Holly uh, <clears throat> that <coughs> sells you know glassware and that sort of thing but it's all used it's all antique same same kind of thing but she focuses on one item you know it's a pleasant store you see customers in there on occasion. I don't think she does a great deal of business, but it kind of doesn't matter. It's a nice-looking store. She keeps it neat, uh, as do the, the large antique store that's next to Blockbuster. They keep their place looking nice. I see nothing wrong at all with those kinds of businesses. We also have the antique trove uh, that's been reduced in size because of REI's expansion, but out on the, uh, on the east side. I see nothing wrong with these businesses, and I see no reason whatsoever to uh, put a hardship, as, as Mr. Girdlestone talked about, when someone comes in and wants to lease a space. Uh, you know, why, why put conditions on these people that they have to go through and ex extra expenses when they're legitimate business people? Now, on the other hand, I think what we want to protect ourselves from is, uh, while we all can appreciate the nonprofits that uh, 
like the St. Paul's, I think it is, and, and the other store that's no, that, that's not in our city, but it's in Redwood City on the El Camino. We have one on the El Camino that sells, uh, you know, used used garments and, and so forth. And I don't think we, uh, while we can respect that kind of business, I don't, I don't think we want that kind of business in our downtown. So what I would like to see out of this ordinance, this is where I'll uh, respectfully disagree with the, the public speaker, I don't want to play with semantics all day long, but on the other hand, this is our opportunity to get this thing right. So let's do it. Um, it, it might take a little more, more time. That's why we, we gave ourselves the year, not, not to use it, but that's why we gave it, us, ourselves the year on the emergency ordinance. Let's get this right. I don't want antique dealers or, or business people that, that sell antiques to be discouraged from being in San Carlos. The way I see it, uh, we already have a... Uh, a, a small um, seed of this kind of business in town, and I don't think we should discourage it. You go to Half Moon Bay, they have a number of antique stores in Half Moon Bay, and people know that, and they go there. We have some in San Carlos. People know that. They come here. It's good for business. I don't think we should penalize these people by making them go through a conditional use process. Thank you. Councilmember Royce? Yes, I'd have to uh, agree with C C Commissioner Grocott. I think overall we've had some good experiences with our antique stores. Uh, towns like Folsom and Saratoga uh, actually go to those cities to shop, but it's a secondary impact. They, they shop in other stores. They have lunch. Uh, you get more foot traffic. I think it's healthy uh, to bring people from other cities into our city, and they do draw. I think uh, most importantly, if I could shed some of my experience of the last three years on the planning c commission, I can't remember any applications uh, for conditional use permits of antique stores additionally wanting to come onto Laurel Street. So I don't see a, a big demand uh, where if we don't do anything this evening and go ahead and, and continue on and move through this, that uh, they'll, they'll be pounding the door down to... Uh, to try to come into town. And, uh, and the last part is, is, is uh, just a little trend of green uh, with Pat Potter in the audience and so forth. This reminds me, um, you know, I think we're going to see more and more of, of recycled reuse. There's some, when I buy furniture, I like to buy stuff that's 40 or 50 years old made out of real wood uh, rather than, yeah, yeah. you know, dumping it at the uh, uh, garbage site. So. Uh, you know, re reusing. I think some of these stores add a little bit of, of recycling. Uh, that's good for all, too. Great. Thank you. Vice Mayor Grassilli. Uh, I had a question for the city attorney. Um, these apparent, uh, this ordinance was discovered or whatever uh, that antique stores fell under a, um, a use permit. Um, <laughs> were there that's the only item we're talking about because there's no other changes that we made. Any other item, any other businesses that were under a use permit that we've changed in this ordinance? Not that I'm aware of. Okay, so that's the only one this week. For this week, right. <laughs> Deborah Nelson, um, in answer to the question, there is one awkwardness, and that is the um, the on the El Camino Real, this broad definition of resale and consignment sale actually puts a size limitation and a distance between uses. So In the what, law right now. In the law right now. So Obviously. what you would end up with is resale and consignment sale on Laurel Avenue and San Carlos Avenue that is more generous than what you allow on the El Camino, and that was an also I, under my unintended consequences comment. Um, so there could be a consideration of whether you want to get rid of that size limitation on the El Camino if it makes no difference um, or if you and or if you wanted to add a size limitation um, on Laurel Avenue and San Carlos. But, but wait, there's more. Avenue. That's That's my problem. There's more. Oh, there's more. There's more again. And nothing against you, Ms. Nelson. I no clue how to read all those codes and all that stuff, and yeah. has nothing to do with you. Um, I, I agree with Mr. Siskin, who has patiently sat through our uh, deliberations for a long time. Uh, when we voted on this two weeks ago, I was a little, you know, I was very um, 
uh, happy to, to extend it for a year only be, to give us insurance just in case we needed it. What I'm concerned about is now we have antique stores, now we have size. Next week, what will we have? And then the week after, well, wait, there's more. Mm -hmm. and, and we can change it. I'm per I honestly believe that we pass an ordinance. It's a good ordinance. We're not, we're not changing anything. The, the antique stores were under a use permit before, and they'll be under a use permit again. Mm -hmm. And we're not changing that. And I think the more we get into this, we're just going to parse this thing and, and wordsmith this puppy, and we'll be here for another six months. And I, that's not, even though I voted for the year extension, that's not what I intended. I intended it in two weeks just to make sure we'd have our edge and then we'd vote for it. So on my side, I'm voting for the ordinance the way it was and the way we passed it two weeks ago. And I'm, I'm concerned that we're going to, we're going to, we're going to just keep finding something else in the code. Maybe it's the size now or maybe it's something else. And again, nothing, no dis, uh, dispersion on the staff. I'm just, what else is next? And that's what I'm concerned about. We've beaten this thing. We, the, the, the folks in the, in the economic development area and the, and, the, and the merchants have gotten together and I think crafted a real good thing. And if, if it has to, if, if this little part of it has to, as someone said, they're not lined up to come in, so I'm not too concerned about it personally. Mm -hmm. But that's how I stand. So, Through the chair. Yes. When we gave this back to staff, however, and voted on it, at least in my notes, I had put in the language, and that's how we had read it, that it would say uh, used books and magazines are exempt, and we were going to add antiques, antique stores to, to that uh, parenthetical statement. It's not in here now, so that's not how the that, that's how I was expecting the reading of the ordinance to be. It's not in here. That's how we voted on it. It's not in here. And we've instead run into a bump in the road uh, simply because I highlighted antiques. And then apparently uh, Mr. Ahmad came in and had this made. And in the making of this chart, it was discovered that uh, antiques were a conditional use permit. So I, I would prefer we get this cleaned up. We gave it to staff last time to clean up. And, and in, uh, in trying to clean it up, they discovered this problem. I, I think we take, you know, two more weeks is all we're asking for and uh, get it cleaned up and then uh, we've got it right because we're going to have this for a long time. Yeah, it, um, it was my impression what council passed last time. The intention of what we wanted was to add secondhand stores to this ordinance and that was the spirit with what we took the vote on. Um, so it's, it's my impression that's, that's what council voted on last time. And this is actually saying, oops, we made a mistake. We couldn't do that now that we're going to, we need to change that to add that. And now we'll have, if we do this, we'd have to, the unintended consequence really is two more weeks. Um, and um, I also wholeheartedly agree with Vice Mayor Grisso that we need to get on with this. And, and honestly, if we knew this before, we'd be already two weeks into this. That's right. So I, I don't see it as a city council vacillation so much as I see it just as a, a technical oversight. And uh, so I, I would encourage a motion and a vote, and uh, let's move it along. And I guess they're just like, is there any reason why this wouldn't be able to be read two weeks from now? No. That would hold that up. Okay, because I think expediency is, uh, if I'm reading council, everybody would like to move on with it regardless of how they... Okay. Mr. Mayor, if I could just one final comment. I, I, my issue about uh, the antique stores and the retail and consignment, I, I fully recognize and acknowledge that we have good businesses that are putting roofs over people's heads and foods on their table. And the intent is not to come after them with pitchforks and torches. <laughs> but there is a question which I'm putting out for further discussion, which is what is our vision of downtown? And what I'm hearing from some of my colleagues on the dais is, hey, maybe downtown is a destination place for antiques. I personally don't share that vision, but if that's the will of the council, I just want to be clear that uh, this is a vision question, and what are we trying to turn downtown into? Any comments? 
Yeah, I just uh, want to clar clarify. My comments weren't that that was my vision of San Carlos. I, my, my main thought was we, we don't have the demand I've seen in the last three years. If my point was if another antique store does come around the corner next month, uh, I, I see nothing <coughs> wrong with that based on what I've seen in other cities mm -hmm. on the business model there. I don't see it being a the R that we become a, a you know a fulsome. My, my vision for San Carlos is <clears throat> we've already dealt with. We don't have dollar stores. But if we have other legitimate businesses, that, and, and we have some already downtown, uh, the antique stores and so forth, and even uh, consignment stores. There's one in San Mateo over by the fish market. That It's a nice store, and it's, uh, you know, it's used furniture and so forth that people have in there. I agree totally with Randy about you know, if we're going to be a green city, encouraging people to uh, recycle uh, used goods is a, is a good idea as long as it's done respectfully and, and, and in a nice manner. I have no problem with it. And, and I'm not, I, I don't like to have such a strong vision for our downtown that we try to control the market. I don't believe in controlling the market. I believe in letting the market do what it's going to do. Uh, you, you push and nudge a little bit here and there like we're doing about the dollar store issue. But I don't want to be over controlling and I don't want to uh, have a businessman who, or a woman who comes into town with an idea discouraged by condition, conditional use permits. I, I don't work that way. Any other comments? Vice Mayor Grissel? No comments. Yeah, it, it, from my standpoint, it's, a, again, a complimentary part of what downtown offers, and I think to the extent that um, um, I don't think it's an element that I feel like we need to control at this point in time. I think private industry can be that. I don't see us as a uh, destination hub for California for antiques, but I think it's a complimentary set of a bunch of different things that we offer downtown. Right now. So um, I'm comfortable with it. If there's anybody who uh, would like to venture a motion, I'll make a motion. I would uh, like clarification from Deborah Nelson on what we need to do Mr. if Mayor. he's following our, our intent. Let me turn this way. Okay. This is a little too much. Could we, let's simply do it this way to reintroduce the ordinance, read it by title, um, and, and add uh, to that ordinance uh, that antique stores wherever situated in the zoning code uh, uh, in the CS, the CR, um, and the C, CP. CP zones will be permitted uses. Very good. Okay. Someone just read the title as an introduction with that so you can amendment. Read the title, the reintroduction of the title of the, of the ordinance. So I would like to move introduction. Or okay, we're going in introduction of uh, an ordinance of the City of San Carlos, amending Title 18 of the San Carlos Municipal Code to add definitions and purpose, and to amend the list of permitted, conditionally permitted, and permitted uses in the 600, 700, and 800 blocks of Laurel Street and the 11 and 1200 blocks of San Carlos Avenue within the City of San Carlos, and uh, in doing so to include antique stores as a permitted use in all three zones. I'd like to second that motion. Okay, any further discussion? Uh, Christine? Councilmember Roman? Respectfully, no. Councilmember Grisilli? No. Councilmember Grocott? Yes. Councilmember Royce? Yes. Mayor Lewis? Yes. And where did my. We will now move on to item 9B, uh, consideration of introducing ordinance amending the San Carlos Municipal Code. All right. Uh, good evening, uh, honor, <coughs> Honorable Mayor and members of council. Um, this is kind of a first for me as your new uh, building official is the involvement with the adoption of a building code. Um, <coughs> the prior building official, Jack Aiello, uh, wrote the ordinance. Um, I'm responsible for enforcing it, and it's it's a large it's a big change from the prior codes that we've been uh, um, enforcing, but not really that daunting. I went through the seven-hour, three-disc DVD over the weekend and the introductory course of the 2007 CBC, and I, I have to admit that it's it actually clarifies a lot of things and simplifies um, the layout of the code. And um, 
occupancy separation and so forth. It, it's, a, it's a more user-friendly document, in my, in my opinion. Um, they're, they're based upon the 06 I codes. And what it is is simply the California's adoption of the amendments and so forth incorporated, thus the 2007 California codes. Um, we've done a fair amount of outreach with uh, um, engineers, architects, designers, um, contractors in getting the word out with this new um, code uh, to hopefully make it less painful when it comes to adopt or I mean uh, submit for plan check and so forth. And we've also educated ourselves as well. Again, I referenced the seven-hour DB discs I, I watched over the weekend. And um, I think it represents more of a, a, a gray area approach at uh, um, how we used to look at prior codes. Uh, they, they seem to have adopted um, existing buildings that we deal with. Through code check, I mean through plan check and so forth, and have adopted the, or adapted the code to incorporate more real-world situations that we deal with when we're out building, uh, plan checking, and uh, inspecting these structures. And uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have with regard to plan check or how it may impact our enforcement and projects that we may have coming over the counter and so forth. Great. Thank you, Mr. Valley. Does uh, council have questions? You know, I, actually, being in the business, I attended some conferences on this. Um, it, it, sort of a technical question. What options do we really have? We, if we don't adopt this, can we really be renegade and have our own building code out there? No, we're actually, <laughs> if I might, Mr. Sure. Mayor, uh, we're subject to the state code mm -hmm. by adopting our own um, Ordinance, uh, we're able to put in some changes that are unique to our city uh, and, and adopt those changes to the codes. But without uh, enacting our own ordinance, we can't have those changes and we're just subject to all the state codes as of January 1. Okay, and then the only other question I had, and this comes from the, the seminars I attended, were two, two clarifications, uh, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, one is the setback issue with fire code. Yep. Uh, the fire marshals of the state came in and, and set this five-foot, sort of arbitrary, but maybe not, uh, setback and, and impacts windows and rating of those windows and the the, uh, the amount of window you can have. Mm -hmm. And if you could explain how that might work between new structures and people. We, we have a lot of remodel activity in town, so how that might affect uh, people wanting to do that. And the uh, second item that was um, seemed to be up in the air in the conference I went to had to do with the enforcement of um, uh, whether or not a soils report needs to be done and if you could discuss that a little bit. Okay. Um, well, the first item you mentioned is the uh, a, a big change in the code, which is the three to five, well, it was three foot uh, walls less than three foot. I'm, I'm talking specifically residential here, because um, I think that's what you're referring to. Um, uh, walls three foot and less, or less than three feet, required a one-hour rating. The new code, the 2007 California codes, has increased that from three to five feet. Uh, there is an exception in the code, however, <clears throat> for walls that fall less than five feet to be allowed a uh, to to allow 25 percent. Uh, penetration through those walls, windows, doors, etc. And so that's a good question because we have a lot of homes out there that have existing bedrooms all along a, a wall line. And so as an enforcement agency, are we going to, um, uh, how can I say, uh, avoid egress exiting requirements just so we can tighten things up to a 25% uh, um, number. Um, I think that's where we're going to have to use, uh, incorporate a little bit of leeway possibly with some of these new uh, projects that come in, specifically existing homes with existing bedroom locations and so <coughs> forth and natural light and vent and uh, requirements and so forth. So uh, to some degree it, 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 it's going to be on a case-by-case -case basis uh, how we looked at it. If you have a brand new house though, you've obliterated the existing house, you know, it's, it's kind of fair game with respect to the setbacks, in my opinion. Uh, but there are still 
projects that we have coming in that, uh, you know, they're saving four studs to maintain that property line and, or that setback, I should say. And so it's a little song and dance that we do with respect to, um, you know, how we, how we plan check and how we allow these setbacks and force and so forth. Uh, your second question, I think, was with, had to do with uh, soils reports, and your question was, are they required? Uh, the, the question is, um, I, I know we have zones in the city, and we've always required uh, soils reports for certain size projects and so forth. It seems to me the code is tightening up on that, and the concerns that were spoken about at this, uh, the seminars I attended was that even very small projects could trigger a soils report, and you know, on a say, a, you know, if it's a small enough addition, and then a, a soils report is triggered, it gets percentage-wise, it's pretty costly to run into you know, twenty-five hundred to five thousand dollars for a soils report, and you're trying to add a little bathroom or something to your home. With respect to our prior, I I, we're, I don't see that changing for us. With uh, it's still five hundred square feet for in zone. A, 1,000 in Zone B, and I, I don't believe that that's been a, a an item that's that's up for change, according to the ordinance that's written. That's good to hear because that was a, that was a big question at the uh, conferences yeah. that I attended. And yeah, I think that that's I think you I think you might be getting to some various agency uh, requirements at that point. Okay. Uh, ours is still 500 and 1,000 square feet requirements. Very good. Thank you. The questions? The questions? I, I just have a, a couple based on what you just said. Um, if we adopt this, you're saying that there's some leeway needed uh, in some of this, right, in, in, in applying the code? Is that what you're saying? I guess my question is, if we pass this, do you have the leeway that you need to pass yeah. judgment? Yes, I, yes, I do. You're not tying your hands in that I, regard? I, I, I agree. I, I, I think this code is more user-friendly with respect okay. to what we have seen come over the uh, counter in the past okay. and um, what we are going to see coming over the counter. I think it's, it's like I said, it's, more, it's a more user-friendly building code. Um, I'll give you just a real quick example of the hoops that people have to jump through. The, the uh, condominium projects built on the 700 block there, those were built up such that you had more than 50% of the perimeter um, around those buildings, built up to eliminate the lower story, such that you didn't have to worry about the third story exiting. In the new code, it just simply says one exit required from R3, R3 being a single family residential occupancy, period. No more building up perimeter dirt to eliminate that story. It's a, it's, if you look at the retaining walls around those buildings, it's a fairly costly item to incorporate in the building just to get uh, to, to eliminate the requirement for a third story exit, which no longer exists in the code. Okay. Well, thanks for that example, because part two for me was, is there a financial impact that you know you can foresee based on adopting this? Um, I think like, I think that's an example of it being more more user not to Actually, repeat myself uh, went over here, but more user friendly. I think that you'll see people having to jump through fewer hoops to get the kind of projects projects that they want. Of course, with planning approval and so forth. Um, Very good. Thank you. Um, is there a motion? I would move. This is an introduction of an ordinance, so I move introduction of ordinance number thirteen ninety eight. 1398, do I need to read it? Yes. Okay, I will do so. Ordinance of the City Council of the City of San Carlos amending the San Carlos Municipal Code, uh, adopting the 2007 editions of the California Administrative Code, California Building Code, Volume 1 and 2 with appendices <coughs> and amendments, California Mechanical Code with appendices, California Plumbing Code with appendices, California Energy Code, California Elevator Safety, Construction Code, California Historical Building Code, California Fire Code with Amendments, California Existing Building Code, California Reference Standards Code, and the 1997 editions of the Uniform Security Code, Uniform Code for the Abatement of Dangerous Buildings, and the Uniform Housing Code. Thanks, okay. <laughs> Thank you uh, for venturing that uh, onerous motion. Um, we've had a motion and a second.
Christine? Councilmember Amon? Yes. Councilmember Grisilli? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? Yes. Councilmember Royce? Yes. Mayor Lewis? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. And with that, we will move on to item number 10, which is a redevelopment agency <laughs> item. And it's a study session on proposed midterm review of the five-year impl implementation plan and 10-year housing compliance plan for the San Carlos redevelopment project area. And we have a presentation. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and City Council members. I'm Mark Sawicki, the Economic Development and Housing Manager. I'm here tonight to present this uh, study session agenda item on the proposed midterm review of the RDA's five-year implementation plan. Prepared a PowerPoint presentation, uh, which will provide background on the redevelopment agency in the project area, the redevelopment plan, the current five-year implementation plan, and the proposed midterm review and update of the five-year implementation plan. Um, there's a lot to cover. I'm going to try and move quickly, um, and I'm sure you'll have lots of questions by the end of it. Um, just by way of background, these first few slides will, will provide a little, a little context. Um, Community redevelopment law, it's part of the uh, California Health and Safety Code. Uh, it was originally established in 1952 to improve health and safety in decaying urban areas. The body of law has undergone significant revisions over the years, continues to be tinkered with with every legislative session. It provides communities with tools to revitalize areas with adverse physical and economic conditions. That is what is defined as blight uh, in the law provides a framework for creation of a redevelopment agency and governs the adoption and implementation of the redevelopment plan and project area. One of redevelopment's most essential and valuable tools is tax increment financing. It allows local jurisdictions to retain a greater share of property taxes, um, shares that would otherwise be going to the county, school districts, and other taxing entities. The agency can use these, tax can use these funds uh, for tax allocation bonds and finance projects, programs, and activities to alleviate the blighting conditions that have been identified in the project area. San Carlos Redevelopment Project Area was established in 1986. It comprises around 450 acres on the east side and the downtown commercial district. Project area was drawn to exclude residential uses, although housing has been added since, notably the Loreola Oaks project on the former corporation yard. Although eminent domain is another major tool of, the rede of a redevelopment agency, um, the San Carlos Agency did not seek to extend this power when it expired after 12, uh, 12 years after the plan adoption. Here's a map of the project area indicated by the blue shading and oriented with the bay at the top. The area includes, again, the downtown commercial district, the El Camino corridor, the San Trans Railroad property, and most of the industrial areas on the east side. It does not include the Loreola neighborhood the San Carlos Marketplace, and some of the more recently developed east side parcels. Um, doesn't include the Harbor Industrial Area, which was annexed after, I believe, after the, the agency was created, and, and it does not include the, the airport area as well. The original redevelopment plan identified blighting conditions in the area and presented goals and activities to alleviate them. The plan centered mostly on public infrastructure improvements, projects that the city might not have been able to fund otherwise. By law, the redevelopment plan must also allocate 20% of tax increment revenue to housing, to affordable housing, to preserve, improve, and, impro and produce affordable housing. And that's defined as uh, housing affordable to households earning 120% <laughs> of the area median uh, income or less. Um, low, um, uh, low households are defined as 80% or below, and very low are defined as 50% and below. The plan has statutory limitations, some of which have been extended by amendment. The plan and its programs and activities will become inactive in less than 20 years. However, the RDA can continue to collect tax increment to pay off bonds for another 10 years. 
There's also a total debt limit of $70 million. The RDA currently has $15.2 million outstanding, and that includes the additional $7 million of debt that was added in December of 2007 with the bond refinancing. There's also a limit on collecting tax increment revenue, which is actually currently around $240 million rather than the 175 you see there. Um, the plan allows uh, us to increase the limit based on amounts that are being paid out to other taxing uh, entities over time. So $240 million is the current estimate of, of where that would be. The agency has collected uh, over $33 million in tax increment revenue to date. Um, in the past year, the tax increment was $4.7 million, of which $1.4 million was passed back through to, to counties and school districts. The RDA has accomplished much in, in its 22 years, notably the grade separation work and other public in, infrastructure improvements. It also assisted in the creation of affordable housing at Loreola Oaks and San Carlos Elms. This is a, 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 actually a short list of projects. There's, there's, there's many more that the RDA has, uh, has accomplished. Since 1994, the CRL has required a five-year implementation plan to be adopted. The, the existing plan is the third one that's been adopted by the RDA. It was adopted in December of 2006, and it covers the period from fiscal year 2004 to fiscal year 2009. It presents the agency's goals and objectives for the project area. It explains how the goals, objectives, and programs will eliminate adverse conditions, and it describes the anticipated projects, programs, and expenditures for the five-year planning period. It must contain a housing component with a 10-year housing compliance plan. The implementation plan budget is divided into a housing fund and a non-housing fund um, of projects and activities. The housing fund is a statutory requirement. That's where the 20% set aside for affordable housing goes so it can be tracked um, for compliance. The non-housing fund, which is the other 80%, can also be used for housing, but it's not subject to, to these uh, compliance and reporting requirements. The five-year implementation re plan requires a public hearing when it's adopted, when you add and delete projects and activities, and you're required to review the, uh, the implementation plan at least once during the five-year period. Tonight is not a public hearing, not a public hearing, um, but it's rather a study session of the draft midterm review uh, and to present the proposed additions. The public hearing will require a 30-day notice. Five-year plan contains a set of goals consistent with the original redevelopment plan as shown here. The projects and activities all support these major objectives. <coughs> On the non-housing side, um, programs and projects include Wheeler Plaza improvements, South Plaza study, El Camino Carter improvements, etc. Um, two of these projects were already completed in this five-year period, the, the Laurel Street flood control, the industrial road improvements. Um, all the others are underway. In the midterm re review, um, staff has recommended the following revisions to the implementation plan. Uh, increasing funding for a potential Wheeler Plaza development project, increasing funding for economic development, business attraction, and marketing activities, adding a Holly Street widening project, uh, beginning a Britain Avenue widening, pro widening project, and beginning capital improvements for the Holly Street 101 interchange. Um, Parviz would be better to speak to these projects. Um, and I must note that adoption of the implementation plan and this review of the midterm review is not an approval of any of these projects or program costs, and uh, future activities of the agency will still come back uh, for consideration as part of the city's regular budget process. This is really just to, to, to give the agency the framework. Otherwise, you have to go back and do an, a, a public hearing if you added one of these projects later. The non-housing budget, these are uh, some highlights of, of the changes at this midterm point. Um, total forecasted funds available on the non-housing side have increased from the existing five-year plan by over $9.6 million. The expenditures have been forecasted to increase by over $5 million. Um, $1.6 million of the expenditure increase is a commensurate increase in pass-through of increment to other taxing entities as the, if, if, if we are forecasting a greater tax increment, obviously we have to pass uh, on a percentage of that. So, so that part will grow. Um, among the project and program changes under the expenditures you see there, um, the Wheeler increase would be an earmark for potentially purchasing additional property around, around that site that could, could uh, facilitate a development. 
The professional services and personnel increases reflect increased budget allocations for uh, both for recent years and for future years. Um, you'll see later that the housing fund allocation in those areas was, was reduced. Um, circulation projects such as the Britain Avenue widening, Holly Industrial and Holly 101 projects that you see here are just the beginnings. Um, they would extend through to uh, fiscal year to, uh, 2011 um, and would require another $3.4 million beyond this plan period. Um, the original fund balance had been forecasted at $3.1 million and now we're um, showing it at $6.8 million. On the housing side, uh, the implementation ha plan has, this, uh, has a uh, housing component that identifies the housing goals and objectives and programs over the, over the five-year and ten-year period, um, projects the number of affordable housing units needed over the five, ten-year and remaining life of the project area, and it estimates the housing funds that, that will be deposited and expended. Um, some further background on housing compliance. If the agency develops housing, it's required to provide 30% of that to very low, low, and moderate households. If the private sector develops housing in the project area, the agency needs to ensure that 15% is for very low, low, and mod, including 6% for very low. Very low is, again, 50% of area median income. The agency currently has a 34-unit surplus in its production uh, target or requirement. Um, of 80 units that have been built in the project area to date, 46 of them were affordable, while only 12, 12 would have been required to be produced. So we have a, a surplus of 34. The agency anticipates uh, at least another 361 units will be created by fiscal year 2014, um, and that's basically the Transit Village in 1000 El Camino. This would create an obligation to, uh, to produce another 54 units of affordable housing. The existing plan contains the following housing fund projects and programs, affordable housing assistance for the transit village development, assistance to local nonprofits, as we've been doing, uh, first-time homebuyer mortgage assistance program, and project administration planning and debt service. Staff proposes adding the following to the housing fund projects and programs, increasing the assistance to the local nonprofits. Um, a review and potential update of the BMR ordinance to better conform to state density law and the CRL and to better facilitate housing development, um, as well as investing in a potential new affordable housing development project or augmenting what we might provide uh, for the San Carlos Transit Village project. As the fund balances grow on the housing side, the agency is required to spend them. Um, so we will need to be either looking for new projects or finding ways to, to add additional dollars to projects that are, that are going to, to create more affordable housing. Um, again, note that adoption of these added projects at the midterm review um, does not commit the agency to funding them or, or doing them. Uh, they would come back for further review. On the housing budget side, uh, the projected fiscal year 2009 fund balance has grown by another $700,000 since the existing plan forecast was created. Um, tax increment and rental revenue are greater than forecast, while professional services and personnel costs have been reduced on the housing side. The five-year budget contemplates at least an additional $500,000 will be allocated to a housing project by fiscal year 2009, although that hasn't been identified where, where we might want to start spending that money. This concludes the presentation. Uh, the next steps are to provide staff with uh, your feedback um, and direct staff whether to schedule a public hearing to adopt the proposed review and changes to the implementation plan. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and with that, because it's study session, anybody you'd like to kick off discussion or venture a thought? Please dive in. I have one question. That's my uh, Just for clarification. Um, where, I know you said the uh, new marketplace doesn't fit in the, in the area, but what about Howard Avenue on the other side of uh, Industrial Road? Does it? Um, I believe so. I can go back to the map if you want. You wouldn't mind, yes. Yeah. You could point out. You see the straight across industrial uh, on either side of Howard. Those are those industrial condos, which 
um, were probably built just you know sometime prior to the agency um, creating so, the, the I project see a, area. A finger that reaches out and touches, I think, Highway 101. Is that where? Is that Howard Avenue? <clears throat> um, Howard Avenue is right here. Oh. So the intersection of Howard and Industrial is not in the, not in, not in. Okay. Are, is is your question about public improvements in that area? If we were to consider a project, yeah. If we were to consider um, street widening there, because actually the marketplace is causing some issues with that intersection, and if we could use it, RDA funding to improve, if that. you can make a finding that it's of benefit to the project area, it can be done. Oh, okay. Hmm. Um, now, and that segues to my second question and last question. With the drainage master plan, is we, we can kind of look at the whole city because it impacts this area. Is that correct? Possibly. I think we'd want to ask council about that. <clears throat> okay. Thank the, you. The drainage master plan was originally uh, was a project that was in the implementation plan, but it, it's been um, dropped. Um, because we wanted to, to take a, a look at it. We didn't think we were going to spend the money on it. But we were no. waiting for Regional Water Quality Board, Control Board, to come up with some rules. As, <clears throat> as Council Member Brookot right. says, that, that is exactly correct, and we understand that those rules will be with us uh, in the next couple months. And uh, actually, we have had some discussion with uh, the CCAG staff because some of the, the rules are uh, rather... Uh, high impact on both the city and the residents. So we have some concerns about their scope and cost. And so uh, when if, if we continue this as a project, it's in the list, then uh, the agency pays its fair share. Is that how we work that? Correct. Okay, thank you. That's it. Great. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, Mark, first of all, a great staff report and presentation. Uh, thank you. It's all... Uh, new data for me, and I think it's really uh, an exciting time here uh, for all of us. Uh, uh, first, just one question and one comment. Uh, this first time home buyer's mortgage assistant, I mentioned in the report, there's been no qualified applications. Are, are people aware, or why aren't there? <coughs> is there any activity in this area? Um, I've had maybe one or two inqu inquiries since I've been here. Um, I think it can be promoted better. Okay. So that may be something, okay. And uh, my comment would be I'm, I'm really interested to uh, spend a little more one-on-one -on -one time with staff or maybe other council uh, people or, uh, uh, on this uh, Holly and the 101 exchange just to understand that. I'm very interested on traffic flows, uh, Britton, Howard, Ho Howard, uh, and Holly, and uh, just uh, got a lot of campaign input on that. And mm -hmm. I, I don't know what, you know, I, I think I think I understand a little bit of the exchange, a little bit of Holly, but how they interact together, I really would, would like to understand that better. Not 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 now, but we could talk about that later. Just, just to clarify, uh, in, in the near future, we're bringing an amendment to the circulation element uh, to incorporate some of the uh, mitigations that were set forth in the PAMP VIR which would include the interchange uh, and the widening of Holly. Okay. So that will be a presentation before you, and you'll get to see it. Good. Super. Thank you. Yeah, I, and again, the, the, the mention of these projects at this point is because we're going to have a public hearing, and that's the time to get them in the implementation plan if they're going to be done in the next couple of years. Excellent. We don't have to do them, though. Great. Well, thank you. Councilmember Member Lott. Sure. Uh, thank you for hitting the... Uh, Mortgage assistant question. I had oh. yeah, that also. Uh, with regard to the number of affordable housing units we need, or BMR, uh, you made mention of 54 units would be available through uh, the 1000 El Camino project and the proposal for the uh, transit village. Does that add, a, number one, did I get that number right? Yes. <clears throat> okay. It, it, it means the agency would have a production requirement. Since we have a 15% BMR ordinance, they should be produced by virtue of the ordinance anyway. The, the tricky part is in the, in the uh, redevelopment area, you have to hit certain tar uh, target levels. Um, <coughs> the good news is that the BMR ordinance is, is weighted heavily on very low and low. So it's a, I think we'll meet the CRL requirements. 
So the 54 units would be an appropriate number? Are we above or are we below hmm. the number that we need? The, 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 the 54 was 15 percent of what we expect to be developed. So that's what CRL requires. That's what our BMR ordinance requires. So for all intents and purposes, they should be, they, they will be produced. Um, what we might want to do is consider producing more of them with, with the additional funds that the agency has. There's a project already underway. We could have more affordable units. We could have uh, a deeper affordability, more very low. Maybe staff can help me out because I'm getting confused about there was another requirement for the city, or I guess this is countywide. No. State. So it's statewide. State mandated housing production, EMR. So I guess my question is, does that 54, it does. Okay, thank you. Well, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, pursuant to that point, we also have an A bag um, that's the one I'm overarching uh, a lot of uh, uh, regional housing needs allocation. Right. So the question is, I had a similar question, you. is this then bring us into compliance with the A bag resolution? I think it gets us very close. I suppose we get a little bit more precise of that down the road. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, there there are compliance levels. It, it's 599, and uh, we can't be expected to produce 599 affordable housing <laughs> units, of course. And they have their own uh, affordability requirements, and I think we're gonna we're gonna be okay. We're gonna get close to those requirements with the projects we have online. But right, just as a as a member, we're making. I just want to make sure we're making good faith progress toward those goals because that's yes. what we said we'd do. Great. Do you have more uh, questions, Councilmember Uh Thank you. No. Vice Mayor Grisselli? I have no questions. Thank you. Um, I, have a, I have a couple of questions. So one, one is ABAG. Uh, the other thing is I, I just concur with uh, Councilmember Grocott's comments. It seems like the San Carlos Marketplace has created a new uh, um, flow patterns in that area that we need to adjust to. I know I've heard that from more than one person, experienced it myself. So I would maybe some part of our discussion later we can talk about if council uh, agrees with maybe uh, adopt we would adopt this that area into the uh, development area is that what we would do procedurally how does it work we would just take a look at uh, whether or not we could make findings that uh, improvements to that area would benefit the entire project area i mean if we can make findings that if we were to improve that area, then as Mark indicated, we may be able to use some redevelopment funds to contribute or, or supplement other city funds in making uh, adjustments in the area. Uh, but I'd have to talk with the public works folks in terms of, you know, how extensive uh, improvements would need to be in order to have that kind of a regional impact. Okay. Um, may I uh, add to that, Mr. Mayor? Um, with regard to the issues, uh, the difficulty entering and exiting uh, that we've, we've seen, um, the developer is coming through with some improvements to the entryway, really significant improvements. Uh, they're going to add a lane and widen the um, entry lane, so you'll have now you'll have two lanes out and one much wider lane in. Um, so. Uh, and, and our engineer uh, has done a peer review of that and thinks that that should alleviate most of the issues uh, in the movements there. So um, that may just alle alleviate it on the developers um, within their costs. So that's I great think news. Might, yeah. I think that's you know we need to let that development settle in and we have to react accordingly. So that's good for reacting to it. That's probably all that we're all interested in at this point. And, and if I could just add on this, I think uh, I agree very much with Al. I think we need to let the dust settle. There's still work being done. There's an exit lane that's coming out that's not even done yet. Uh, but there's also this this time with with retail sales in that area with Best Buy and the other stores. Uh, you know the peak periods, either sales or holidays and so forth. And I think we need to continue to work with the developer, whether it's uh, a couple people out in the parking lot moving traffic through or whatever. Let's let's make sure that we do the best we can on site first before we start spending a lot of money outside the site. I'd rather look at the developer and the, the site itself as much as possible to fine tune that uh, before we spend any money. You, Mr. Mayor. Uh, quick question. When you describe that we need to do findings, can you talk a little bit about the process? Is this another $100,000 consultant? Is it a public works director goes out and looks at something? What do we? What do you mean when findings? 
need to be done? This redevelopment agency would have to make findings. It actually may be the city council technically it has to make findings. You know, it'd be the well, I'd have to talk to council actually to, as to which agency it is. But but you have to make findings that uh, uh, the the project itself will benefit the the uh, the redevelopment project area and address the blight issues within the agency boundaries. So we would do a traffic study. Uh, and you know whether whether Parvis could do that for us, uh, or whether we'd have to hire a traffic consultant. Uh, it would probably depend when we did it, um, but probably hiring a traffic consultant to do a traffic study showing that whatever improvements we were proposing would benefit the adjacent redevelopment project area uh, by you know reducing the, uh, the, the the traffic levels or facilitating improved traffic flow at intersections and the like. Uh, I would tend to agree that uh, you know, uh, we have some adjustments that we have planned made for that intersection in particular, and there will be a second exit coming out. Uh, and, and you know, beyond that, I'm not I'm not sure that we would be able to, in, in good faith, make the kinds of findings that would be necessary to uh, use redevelopment money. Uh, that would test any kind of a challenge that might come forward. So. Uh, if, if we're interested in doing that, uh, we'd want to take a look at the intersections that were in the project area and see whatever improvements that we were making to the area as a whole, uh, uh, you know, what, what kind of an impact they would have. But then we would bring that evidence to you, and you would have to make the finding based upon some kind of a, you know, documented program that we were able to provide. Great. Thank you. Then on the... Um First time home buyers, I'm just sort of curious. Do we have an active list of people that are interested in that? No, we don't. So there, there is no, there is no list. And how do we notice that? Is it just, is it something people have to find or do we actually? It's on the website. So it's sort of an inactive noticing to, to certain degrees. People have to seek it out. Mm -hmm. I see. I okay. think when, uh, when and if there are BMR units that become available, that would be something that we would promote, promote alongside with the, the potential to purchase a BMR unit. Do, do we have a sense of how many people have taken advantage of that over the years? The first time home buyer? Yeah. I don't. Um, my guess is it's um, one to two dozen. I mean, we've had yeah. any number of agreements over the years. Probably 24 to 20. 20. Yeah. Okay. Really? Good to know. Um, the other question I have on the Holly Street widening, I thought I recalled when we were talking about the whole PAMP project, that you know, in one of these, we we explicitly say that um, uh, traffic mitigation impact fees from PAMF and other future developments. And on the Holly Street widening, I expected the same language to be at the end of it, and yet it just says feasibility of recouping costs from future development. Did we not connect those two when we were talking about the PAMF project? That should be the same, yeah. Okay, so we may just want to. Um, yeah, I think when I was it writing it, I was in the document. Shortening the uh, no, the that's okay. I mean, as long as we're all as long as we're all clear, I just I was surprised not to see it in there. And then um, I'm curious as to when we talk about three million dollars, is staff recommending three million dollars for the future budget for Wheeler Plaza, um, potentially allocating that many funds as we move forward on some plan for Wheeler? Is that what? The suggestion it, it, it's an earmark it's not a it's it, it, there's no project there's no you know nothing proposed at the moment but we think there may be some opportunities uh -huh. and we're just you know we came up with a number okay because I, th I think that bears some discussion uh, amongst councils so I was just curious about technically you know how do we come up with that number and what does that represent in staff's mind I guess is my my question for us to be able to discuss I mean, and, and that is a good discussion point because whether or not the return on investment would be better for Wheeler or whether it would be better on the east side uh, is is something we'd like to hear your thoughts on. Um, uh, certainly, we recognize the importance of, of Wheeler Plaza, both in terms of its uh, housing potential, but also in terms of uh, you know adding to the character of uh, of the downtown. Uh, but from a pure return on investment, uh, there, there may be more uh, uh, value in uh, doing something on the east side, maybe with the landmark site. Uh, but on the other hand, your $3 million may not go as far uh, for a large project on the east side. Okay. Great. Through the chair. Yes. Uh, another question. I, I believe this would be for staff so that we could discuss it. Do we need to uh, – you, you've got some projects included in here. Um, and I suppose as 
council discussion we might want to include some projects that are not in here you would want to hear about that can we also would you also want to hear about the possibility of the coupling our funds and specifically what i'm thinking of is south plaza we've moved around with that for years we've got money locked up in property ownership there not not the plaza itself but we own an apartment building just north of the plaza do you want to hear us talk about decoupling possibly from money that we have i mean i think i think a couple of things there one we do have a project that we're going to be bringing back to you for discussion specific to south plaza so having that incorporated into the plan perhaps is nothing more than staff shall analyze the the value of maintaining that property vis-a-vis uh, divesting ourselves of that property. Having that kind of language perhaps in the plan is appropriate. Uh, it's, it's something we're already doing, uh, frankly. Uh, so yes, I mean, I think the answer is yes. It's some kind of a footnote or uh, a notation that uh, you have an interest in looking at uh, perhaps that or other properties and, and, and determining how they should be uh, utilized or not utilized. Thank you. Okay, good. Any other uh, questions at this point for staff? Okay. Discussion topics? Would you like to talk about anything? I think uh, something that a number of us have hit on, and maybe we're thinking in the same direction, is this first-time homebuyer mortgage assistance. And uh, one of the things I think of is, you know, our police chief was standing here last council meeting talking about what police officers look at for working in a city. And I think... Um, you know, maybe what we need to do is have a, a little project, if you will, of researching what is it about this program that does not make it enough of an incentive to use. Because I would like to see, you know, our police officers use this if, it, if it's usable. Some of our city staff and also just people who live in town who might be renting, would be first time home buyers, would like to own home in San Carlos, but they're just at that cusp where they can't, you know, get over the hump. You know, maybe we, we do something through Parks and Rec to educate people on, you know, what would this be about if you were to involve yourself in this, but something to get this thing. Some sort of more active outreach. Yeah, so I think uh, to summarize quickly, uh, let's, let's interview some people and find out why the, to them this looks not enough of an incentive and then number two let's look at at an outreach program after we maybe figure out what might be broken with it yeah. the the other discussion item I, I would put forth is what, what I mentioned is South Plaza <coughs> and perhaps giving staff it, it sounds like they're already looking at that but I think divesting ourselves of that project so that we quite frankly can use the money better in some other location perhaps it's on the east side uh, perhaps it's Wheeler Plaza, but I, I think we have beaten a dead horse there and we need to get out of it. Yeah, and, and from my standpoint, it would be good to see uh, staff come forward on something at South Plaza just to say, hey, here's the reason it's been inactive and here's what we think we can do with it. It's time to, we should, we should move on. So that's great to hear that you guys are taking a look at it. Maybe that will satisfy you to move forward and find out more about that. Yeah, and if there's anything else in here that we feel that way about, it would be good mm -hmm. to... Those are my comments. That's right. Yeah. Thank you. And, and this is also discussion, so uh, yeah. we can feel free to uh, overlap one another. Sometimes the discussion can be uh, more formal than it needs to be in a discussion stage. So please jump well, in. One thing I put on my uh, wish list is uh, specifically with regard to the earmark to Wheeler Plaza, uh, where would that $3 million be most effectively spent? How would you like to see it worked with? I, I wanted to get a, a little bit more meet behind what we want to do with Wheeler and why I'm going to earmark that money. Yeah, no, I think we should, I mean, we should talk a little bit about that tonight. And part of it is, you know, with two new council members, we've had some discussions and, and staff, maybe you can do a little bit of a review where we had, you know, economic study done downtown. There's some, some of us on council that have been sitting on council had a chance to give some opinions and thoughts about Wheeler and, and how it might be. Uh, redeveloped in a way that could make it. I think you know some of the discussions have been about more of a gathering place, trying to invigorate retail and, and traffic and pedestrian, and, and make more of a perhaps a centerpiece in town there. And it's kind of a, a vision for that Wheeler Plaza area. So um, 
I mean, this, this is a good time to sort of have you guys also perhaps think about think about what you know, Wheeler Plaza, if you haven't already, what, what it could be coming for us all to think about. Um, is that something we want to start to pursue, something in that area? Through the chair. Please. Can I ask a, a counselor or staff a question? I, I guess I'm a little confused on what we're doing tonight. Uh, at one point it says the alternative is scheduled a public hearing. It would seem to me that a lot of this discussion should be in front of the public. Uh, with people knowing that it is a public hearing. Are we, how much of this study session are we supposed to get into, so to speak? And, and, and what if we want? Anything that you'd like to. Exciting tonight. things. Uh, well, as, you know, and the reason we structured it this way. Just a question of how we do this, that's all. Yeah, I mean, at this juncture, before we got too far in actually putting forward a, for, a final document or what we think is a final draft uh, for public hearing, we wanted to have the opportunity for some discussion with the City Council. As you might recall, uh, uh, when we brought the the plan forward uh, for adoption in 2006. We were late in, in, in bringing it to you. It was It's for the period from 2004 to 2009. Uh, so we did it in a rather hurried fashion. Uh, in, a, in, in, in some ways, I think it was a perfunctory approval of many concepts that were in the prior plan so that we could actually be legal mm -hmm. and have, a, ha have an active plan. Uh, this time, as we pledged then, uh, when we did the midterm review of the plan, uh, we thought we'd do it in a more studied approach and solicit more of your comments and feedback informally through this study session before we actually drafted the final document. Okay. Um, so the, you know, it's just an opportunity for some informal discussion. On Thank you. I just want to make sure that we're, we're accomplishing what we're trying to do and make sure the public has its input on, on all these items, too. Yeah, I mean, so. you know, this is on the agenda. Obviously, if the public wants to comment tonight, they're, they're, they're able to do that. Uh, we didn't notice it at the public hearing because... Right. That's my question. Yeah. We, we so, will be doing okay, that sorry. later. I just, just want to make sure that we're, you know, we, we don't get ahead of ourselves. That's all. That's all. Or, or repeat ourselves in a month or something, and now we're going to have the same discussion again, so... Okay, thanks. Through the chair, a couple more Please, comments, if I, if I may. Um, regarding Wheeler Plaza, I, that's another project that we've, you know, been working on for a long time where it sat stagnant and then it comes up and so forth. It, it's come up at, at our uh, strategic planning mm -hmm. uh, meetings. And, uh, you know, with just with respect to our former mayor, it was a, a big project. Uh, it was important to him, mm -hmm. and he he would really like to see at least something done on that, whether it goes forward or it doesn't go forward. Let's have a final decision and, and move on. And I would tend to agree with that. Um, my comments during the time that we talked to uh, Bill Lee in the economic uh, study, and Wheeler Plaza was a part of that, was if if we're going to redevelop Wheeler Plaza, I don't see doing it just for the sake of more density and more housing. I would only see us doing something there if we really gained something for the community. And the thing that I see that we could gain for the community, and that's been talked about before by uh, the consultant that talked about uh, the, just the whole uh, visioning of downtown, was a gathering place. That if we could somehow uh, refocus Wheeler Plaza, it, right now it focuses on Walnut Street, which is the back door and because it's all designed for the automobile. And I think redesigning it so that it focuses on the Laurel Street and perhaps has some kind of pedestrian plaza, um, a place that we could do our, our market without having to close the street, uh, a place where we could have concerts other than the park, it would just be a great community asset. So if we could gain that community asset and at the same time do the redevelopment, perhaps add some housing, then I think the community, you know, there, there's a, some of these people that were here earlier on uh, the ordinance, I know that there are people who are strongly opposed to the redevelopment of Wheeler Plaza, especially if it's just for more density and more housing. Mm -hmm. But I think if you give something to the community that benefits, then perhaps it becomes more acceptable. And that, that would be my comment on and, that. And that, again, just to, for me to sort of bracket uh, Vice Mayor Grisselli's point, the, the way I see this is these are sort of various projects and, and what level of activation are we looking for staff to to look into these things and, and from the Wheeler Plaza standpoint because in the two years I've been here we we gave some feedback to somebody from you know about some ideas for that but really not a lot has happened in a couple of years so again from my standpoint it's 
but, you know, it's difficult at this point without a public hearing and all that stuff to work in a lot of detailed mode. But is council, is this, what, what's the preference of council? Do we want to, you know, tell staff, yeah, let's have this be an active part of the redevelopment plan. Let's start to earmark money that might be spent. Mm -hmm. and, and we're sort of sending the signal of um, should we, you know, move on something, not move on something? And, and I think from my standpoint, it feels like we, there's been discussion about Wheeler Plaza. And so what's council's pleasure? Is this something we'd like to activate? And I think that's... I think that's part of the ask on staff here is if we earmark money to this, then it'll activate that and we'll start to generate some activity about decisions in that area. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor, I'll, I'll put down my personal preferences. I would love to see Wheeler Plaza activated. Uh, I would like to see the first time home buyers uh, program really juiced up. Uh, I would echo Councilman Grocott's uh, comments that I would like to see if uh, our police department could be, uh, if you were more actively enrolled in that. Uh, the other thing I would like to see if we could put in here is, is potential development of East San Carlos Avenue. Uh, as we start to see retail built toward the industrial uh, roadside, it's somewhat interesting to look at what are the pedestrian crossways to be able to get from industrial to our, if I'll just call it our classic downtown. And that part of East San Carlos Avenue could be a place where some development making it a bit more pedestrian friendly, that could be something that we, we really should look at. So I would put that down on my list of Christmas list. <laughs> Along with a blue, blu ray DVD of Ratatouille. <laughs> Mr. Mayor. I second that. <laughs> oh, uh, now I got beat up on this one time before. I'm going to bring it up again. And we have got a new council. <laughs> I think Mr. Royce knows where I'm going. I talked to him about this one time. Well, maybe, okay, I'll accept you don't. Uh, but at one time, I had talked about this city hall and its age and so forth. And I think perhaps a project we could throw out there and use redevelopment money for is a study of how we might open ourselves up to, uh, well, just looking around town, perhaps it's on the east side, a location for a new city hall and some kind of city campus that might incorporate some of the other needs that, that the community has told us about, which would be a swimming pool, uh, athletic fields, or a stadium type place to play soccer and practice soccer and other sports. Um, and, and we might be able to find such a way to do that if we look around and perhaps we look at this site and for, for redevelopment of some other, you know, maybe it's housing that, that reflects what's across the street. Uh, but do we want to look at that? Do we want to give that direction to staff to at least noodle on that idea for a little while? Not that we would necessarily, you know, it's not a project, it's not something we're necessarily doing, but at least begin to look at that. Mm -hmm. No. No. <laughs> 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 no, through the chair. I mean, Council Member Grocott, I, I, you know, seriously, any idea that we come up with, I think, is a, is a, is a good idea because there's, there, nobody's a super expert up here on, on all this stuff. But I, I think, uh, in, in, in terms of, uh, of, um, as, as, as Council Member Ahmad said, uh, Christmas list or wish list or whatever, we can put 50 things on there, but I think we have to prioritize. And I think the one thing that this does, um, and if we want to add to it, that's fine, but, there's, I don't know, 20 items on here. I'm not sure how many items are on here, Mr. Weiss, but there are at least 20 items, I guess. And, and it would seem like that we want to make sure that we concentrate our assets, in, the, in my opinion, and on the ones that perhaps might be, again, the rest of the council has to speak to it, you know, the prioritization of what we want to do. So, I mean, that's, what, that's my only comment, is that I th I'm, in my opinion, that may not be as high a priority as some of these others that we have here for our use of our, our assets and our time and staff time, too, to look at. And, and I don't mean to go out of order, but just because it's uh, something the that mayor. we've talked about. But no, no, I mean, I'd like to, everybody to, to dive in first. Um, <coughs> to me, that, you know, a big, a big idea, like that's a big change, is part of um, a sort of bigger vision ideas. And, and, and if, if we consider an idea like that, I think we should open it up for staff and council to do their own vision. What other big ideas, if we were going to, you know, if we felt like, the town needed some rearrangement or something that, that was a big idea like that, then I think we should look at that in conjunction with other ideas. And, and I actually think it's, it's 
it would be good. I've talked to um, the city manager about in our strategic planning session, or perhaps as an adjunct to that, um, is there a way for the council to have some sort of a, a time where we can actually retreat and think creatively about um, where, where do we see the city 25 years from now? And, and, and what are some of the ideas that, that we have together? So we can also sort of get in step with each other's ideas and maybe um, uh, and have that, uh, whether it's facilitated or not, but do it in such a way where we can bring in big ideas. And that may or may not fold into the old, everybody's big idea, but, but it, it is, um, I, I, I'm not sure, I, I'd like to send, see us spend more time in thinking about things like that because that's the only way you get momentum started on, on big things. And, and I think that we, um, a lot of us get excited about uh, on council is what, you know, we feel that sense of responsibility and duty to look out for the community 20 to 25 years from now. And so I, I hate to um, discourage a big idea because everybody, it, in a way, you just can't conceive of that much money and how do you make all those pieces meet and how does staff go off and start to pursue something that there might be a lot of staff time and something that there's not momentum for. So. If we had a venue where we could talk, retreat, think creatively about some big ideas and, and start to feel like it penciled and start to feel like a good idea for the community, then we could get momentum on something. But I, I, I would like to, rather than that, build that into the redevelopment plan at this point, I'd like to see council um, perhaps in the first half of the year have a chance to have some of that kind of creative conversation. Mr. Mayor, that type of session that you're just discussing, is that necessarily enveloped in what we're doing on March 18, or are you talking about a different type of session? Well, it's um, what we've typically done in strategic planning sessions is they're f we're falling into a very efficient form, and I think it's extremely valuable, and it's been great for staff and council, and we've got, you know, we've got things that come out of that, and we pursue those things, and, and we uh, there's accountability and all that, so I think it's been good. It's not necessarily where you step back from 20,000 feet and take a slightly broader look. Um, and that component, can, together with a couple new council members, tells me it might be a good time for us to uh, maybe have that opportunity. So it's a little bit different. It's a little bit more pragmatic and practical, and, and I think it's, it's good for that. And, and uh, so it may be in addition to that. I got my calendar. <laughs> I think we'll uh, probably try to have a little more discussion at some point about how, what form that might take, and then we can maybe bring something back to council to consider. Very good. Are there other uh, discussion subjects, staff? Do you have what you need based on the discussion tonight so far? Uh, what we've heard, and correct me if there's more, um, but uh, the first time home buyers program and uh, expanding that perhaps to at least take a look at uh, how it might be of more value to even the police department and other uh, employees. Uh, ensuring that we do the review of South Plaza, um, bringing back Wheeler Plaza, which I'm happy to report we plan on doing in the next month or so. Um, um, let's see. Talking about the dollars for Wheeler Plaza. Uh, first time home buyers program again, Wheeler Plaza. Looking at East San Carlos Avenue. Uh, in terms of, uh, and, and I'm not sure I'm clear here, but what I was hearing is it was a two-phased kind of uh, approach. One, East San Carlos Avenue in terms of its development potential, but, but I also heard in terms of its pedestrian access and linkage to the traditional old uh, or downtown. Uh, so I, I don't know, I, well, what I'm not clear on specific to East San or uh, East San Carlos is where you were, whether you were focusing primarily on a pedestrian access and connectivity uh, of the east to to the downtown, or whether you were looking at development potential of East San Carlos. What I would probably do is, yeah, I'm doing one of these because we haven't done a whole lot of study on this. But I'd probably argue pedestrian access first, okay, followed by further development. And again, just recognizing that we've got significant retail and significant development going on in industrial. We've got, if you will, our core retail area. Uh, or core downtown retail area, access between the two is you know, getting a car and drive. So how can we start to make that a bit more friendly? So is that, um, does that make sense that that be part of the redevelopment? Or in that case, is that something that staff can take a look at and council can consider? And then if it involves redevelopment, it's something that we consider of adding to the redevelopment plan down the road. 
Okay. Making some mention of it in the economic develop or in the redevelopment plan um, may not be bad if we want to throw some economic or redevelopment monies at it. Uh, the, the the good news is that uh, you know with uh, the uh, San Fran's project, uh, with what we're looking at uh, in terms of the El Camino corridor, uh, we are looking at uh, those intersection improvements already. Uh, but making some mention of it within the plan may have some value if uh, if if it might free up some of the monies that we have here that could supplement the project. Right. So, so Council, is there consensus on that? We haven't had much discussion on that I, idea. I, I, I like the idea. I don't like the idea of uh, targeting East San Carlos Avenue. The idea of pedestrian access between the far east side of San Carlos to the core and recognizing, as you say, you know, we've got the marketplace going on over there and so forth. And it is rather difficult if you choose to do something other than get in your car and drive. As you said, it's difficult to get between the two. And I, and yet we, we've got, you know, bicycle lanes and so forth out on East, out on Industrial that we put in when we redeveloped it. It was part of, the, it was a redevelopment project. And yet, try to ride your bicycle from Industrial Road over to our downtown and not kill yourself. Good luck. It's, uh, there's some challenges there. And so I, I would just, all I'm saying is maybe if we look at it in a more general sense as opposed to specifically looking at East St. Carlos. Yeah, no objection. Yeah. Any comments? Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think the, uh, um, our classic downtown, I've heard that term. Uh, this evening it's the real core and the, 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 the nature uh, culture of our city. But with the Grand Boulevard, El Camino, there's opportunity now. The Transit Village. Uh, of course, we're in a very early stage there. The you know the depot and the whole railway corridor. But I also like uh, uh, Old County Road too. I mean, you you have access to the tracks on on either side. Uh, you know, the depot itself is a truly a center place. It's it can be a very beautiful site if it's done right with the transit site and El Camino. Even the Carlos Club is being redone as we speak, or going to be. And, and our classic downtown. So that, that whole corridor uh, warrants some, some, some discussion on how we, we, we do it right. So it, what I'm hearing is that perhaps at our, you know, on March 18th when we have our retreat, we typically talk about areas like pedestrian, uh, you know, safety or traffic or circulation. If we could certainly make this uh, an area to sort of study of how to increase pedestrian traffic to to downtown from the east side and then do a slightly more comprehensive look at it before we add one aspect of it to the redevelopment plan. Okay. Does, that, does that feel like what everybody's yeah. getting along with there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, good. Anything else staff need clarification on or council like to include? Um, I, I'm just, you know, looking through the plan. Uh, we haven't talked, um, and we, we mentioned the drainage master plan and we, we do plan on bringing back a report to you uh, with respect to that. It was mentioned here tonight as well. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, some new redevelopment projects um, and, uh, and revisiting the BMR ordinance was, was uh, one of the items that uh, was mentioned. I don't know if the council has any comments on that uh, at, at this stage, uh, uh, but we do within this document uh, have some interest in revisiting uh, that ordinance. There has been some discussion with respect to uh, um, how effective it's been and, and, uh, and whether there are uh, other avenues that uh, uh, may be with uh, uh, you know, more active role of the city, um, um, you know, facilitating the development of additional affordable housing, uh, or having in lieu programs and the, uh, the city becoming more of, a, uh, of an actual proponent of projects as opposed to um, uh, putting the burden on the private sector uh, through the BMR ordinance. Uh, it's one of the things that uh, we thought we would at least analyze at the staff level. Uh, and we make mention of it within the, uh, the, the implementation plan. Um, but other than that, I mean, uh, I think we've gotten some good feedback from you tonight and uh, we'll proceed to 
put a final project together. I don't know or a, a plan and a public hearing. Uh, I don't think we're on a firm timetable in terms of when this needs to be done, and I suspect we have, I'm looking at Mark just to make sure, I'm suspecting that we have time to have the, uh, uh, the, the study session on the, or the retreat on the 18th of March and bring it back for a public hearing subsequent to that. So if that's okay with the council, we would go through the, uh, the retreat process, uh, give you a chance to you know, think a bit more about what's in this document, uh, work through that uh, uh, work study session, and then incorporate any comments from that into this document as well for a formal public hearing. I, I think that sounds like a good plan. I have one other question. The general plan committee in the process now may come back and want to reinform this as well. So um, I guess the question is, is there anything that's currently being generated that that you might want to incorporate that's not incorporated in this, or will that give us enough time for the, you know, we, we have the fortune of, we have, I mean, and obviously we can uh, change this as, as, as we need to as a redevelopment agency, but I guess I want to make sure that we're incorporating what some of that visioning that's going on with the general plan is as well. Any comments on that, Mr. Yeah, uh, we're entering a really uh, critical stage now of the general plan process, and what it is is alternative development of different land use scenarios for the entire city. And so some of the things that were discussed tonight, uh, for instance, ac accessibility uh, from the west to the east side and uh, what areas of the city should be uh, looked at for future development and what, what are the change areas and opportunity areas in the city. So we're moving into that stage as a community. So uh, I think in the next, it's going to take a couple of months. This is probably one of the most critical, you know, paths that we're on and, and a big milestone for the city. So I would say that we probably may not be through that uh, until April, but we will have gotten into it by the middle of March and we'll know more by the time we meet on March 18th. I'll probably have a better understanding of where we are and I'll be able to give you better information at that time. Um, just from my vantage point, these things need to work in concert as much as they can. Obviously, they're not in perfect lockstep with one another. Councilmember Grokow. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, one of the things I'm noticing as I look at this map that's up here is uh, when we had the flooding uh, with the big storm, a lot of those intersections uh, at Industrial Road that flooded are in, it's, it appears to me, are in that zone. And uh, perhaps... Well, number one, that's just a comment because mm -hmm. th that is blight when you've got flooding going on and you have to close down, you know, half the street. Um, th that's a, a thing of blight in my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, I don't, I don't know if we can do this or not, use these kind of funds, but even aside from the, uh, the drainage master plan, we had even some people from the audience uh, applaud the idea of, permeable surfaces with any new development and maybe using some RDA funds to study what we could do with an ordinance requiring permeable surfaces with any new development, parking lots and, and mm -hmm. so forth uh, in the RDA area so that we can sort of, re we can start to reduce um, runoff and have that go into the ground instead. Right. It's an idea. Yeah, no, I think it's a good idea. I guess from my standpoint, it feels like we're waiting for some of these requirements to come forward from the, um, the regional board. Then we're going to have to regroup and find out what we can finance and what the plans are. But I, I think you're right. We still, uh, you know, from my standpoint, it still feels like we need to um, uh, attack however, our flooding. If I may, Mr. Yeah. yeah. We, can, we can wait. For, I, I can see holding off on the entire drainage master plan for for what the rules are going to be. But on the other hand, we as a city can simply do the right thing. We can mm -hmm. see that uh, we, have issues, right? we have issues and and this is one way to reduce that issue is by requiring permeable services. I, I think we on some of these things we could get going without being told by the state what to do. I agree with you. Um, we, we probably could. I guess one que the question before us on the redevelopment plan, is that an element of a redevelopment plan or is that uh, something else as a council we decide if we want to pursue something like that as a did we hear from staff on that absolutely uh, I think we certainly could 
take a uh, any component of the storm drainage master plan and make it a special project. Um, uh, what you'd, I would think you'd want to do is you'd want to analyze the cost effectiveness of converting two permeable sur surfaces, either with the rehab and remodel through some kind of a schedule uh, or through some kind of a redevelopment program. Um, the, I mean, I think it's my guess. You know, we could check with special counsel. Uh, my guess is that it's a it's an eligible expense. Mm -hmm. um, I think. I think the, the, the redevelopment agency would want to look at it very carefully to, ter to determine if that is the most effective way to get a return on your investment of, of dollars uh, in terms of the money spent, the incremental value in reducing flooding, number one, and then following that forward, and that incremental value in terms of whether it be increased sales tax or property tax or other value to the city. I mean, I think all of that... Uh, should be more fully analyzed. Uh, and I, I really, you know, that's one of the things, one of the values of having this kind of a plan and having a discussion in the context of the economic development plan is, is to start thinking more and more in terms of a return on investment with respect to how we spend all of our discretionary funds uh, so that we're spending our money wisely and converting that money, that, that, that investment, if you will, into general fund dollars that can provide services for the community at large. May, may I comment on that? And the thing I would add to that, uh, Mr. City Manager, is on the, the flip side, where we would not be spending general fund money for expenses of, you know, staff being out during flooding situations, monitoring, you know, we, we have certain expenses that come up because we have this condition, and if, as much as we can reduce that, uh, I, th I think it's a benefit. And, and again, I would also come back to, you know, yes, you weigh the economic value, but sometimes you just look at a situation and you say, do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And environmentally, would we be doing that? Are there other comments on council about flooding element and uh, just including that or, or talking about that in the redevelopment plan? Other council comments? No? So, um, I, I I do think it feels like we have a little bit of a gap in here to me where we're sort of waiting for this other agency to make these determinations. And in the meantime, we have sort of, we're, we're not planning. We're, just, we're kind of waiting. And it, and it palpably feels wrong at this time of year. You know, <laughs> you go down the street and you see some problems there. So um, if uh, through the redevelopment agency we can, again, it's not a, we're not, it's not publicly noticed tonight. We're not taking we're not allocating, taking action or anything, but if there's in the redevelopment um, area a way to uh, earmark funds for potential, whether it's economic analysis of some flooding, you know, control issues, go ahead. I see yeah. you're ready to speak, and I'm ready to stop speaking. Yeah, you know, let, let, let's take a look at it, um, and, and maybe there's a way to formulate some kind of language within the plan that would have us take a, 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 an interim step. I mean, when we were looking at this two years ago, yes, the storm drainage master plan was intended to be the tool that would have generated a master plan for the entire city and would have helped us evaluate the value of doing uh, some of these kinds of programs, the permeable surfaces, the uh, the riparian corridors that would provide areas for waters to settle uh, as opposed to being put into channels and canals and delivered more forcefully to the to the lowlands uh, were all things that people have brought forward and said that these are the environmentally correct things to do. Uh, you know, at some point, those environmentally correct things in terms of cost-benefit for a developed community butt heads with the engineers who tell you, but there's a more efficient way to get the water to where it needs to be, or, or even more efficient ways to store water. Um, and so the storm drainage master plan was going to be designed to help us analyze some of those issues, including that specific issue. And we did put that on the, the back burner until the Regional Water Quality Control Board came out with their analysis, so we knew how much of their analysis would allow us to remove parts of the storm drainage master plan and focus only on those things of interest uh, to this specific community. Um, so and we're going to have that report, I think, within the next three to six months. 
Uh, hopefully we can bring back the Storm Drainage Master Plan and see whether or not it truly is a $500,000 project or a $300,000 project. We can certainly pair it back in other ways if, if, if we care to. Um, let, let us work with it at the staff level and see if we can't come up with some language that might be acceptable. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think interim steps from, from my vantage point, and the council can weigh in on this as well, would be good just because four to six months means we miss another winter and then we miss plants. So anyway, it would be nice to start to make some progress. Agreed. Any other clarification staff uh, like in this item? I think, I think we're good. Thank you. Any other comments, council members? Good. All right, we will then move to item number 6F, which is removed from the consent calendar from earlier this evening. And as soon as I can find that page, be 7A on your thing. Right. It was report on contracting practices from the San Mateo Civil Grand Jury. And th this is just a report uh, prepared by the city attorney in response to the grand jury report, which was very complimentary to the city for the progress that it has made uh, with its contracting practices. And so typically uh, the city responds when there's a report from the grand jury. Uh, so we've written a short little letter uh, acknowledging the, uh, their efforts and, uh, and applauding them as well. And this report from the grand jury group was unique because it was one page. Uh, just as we've looked at what's going on before, what the city's adopted with its purchasing ordinance, and everything looks fine. Uh, thank you to the past grand juries and thank you to the city. I went specifically to county council, who represents the grand jury, and I said, do we even need a response? This is wonderful, great to get a letter like this. I said, not really, but a letter such as we've included here, which um, um, says thank you very much, uh, it would be a, a good way to go. That's why it's presented to you in that way. Okay, thank you. And uh, the reason I pulled it is uh, because enveloped in this report from the grand jury or, or uh, response from the grand jury is just the whole contracting issues that we've had in the past. And uh, while we've cleaned that up a great deal, we've looked at the ordinance and so forth, we still do have some uh, contracting situations, and one in particular that I have continued to be concerned about <clears throat> is with our public works director. Um, and with a new council, two new members, uh, when we did go forward on the recommendation of city staff, on how to handle that situation, which just for the sake of the other two council members, what we did was we we were looking at the public works director position. Should we continue with the contract and uh, in the meantime go out and advertise for a assistant position, hire an assistant, and then bring that person hopefully up to speed so that in the, sometime in the future we might be able to uh, have that person step up to the public works position, uh, city engineer, public works director, uh, at, at the time that uh, the current public works director, city engineer, would actually retire in June, this, this coming June. Um, the direction I was looking with that was more to go ahead and advertise and hire a, a city engineer, public works director, and retain our current person as a consultant, as a true consultant, until this person got up to speed. We did not elect to do that. But I was told, we were told as a council, that we, we have the right to bring that contract forward for review any time that we wish to. Um, so in looking at this report from the grand jury, yes, we've done a lot. We've cleaned up. We still have uh, a staff position, a department head, role being fulfilled by contract. I would, especially with the new council, like to have the opportunity at our next council meeting, if we could, to bring that contract forward, review it, see if we want to continue with that uh, until June as it's scheduled, or perhaps we want to uh, terminate that earlier. It would be some savings if we did terminate uh, because of the nature of the contract. I think it's $198,000 a year. Uh, it's a Pretty good chunk of change, um, and so I'm. I was talking to the city manager about this very issue, and he suggested that I bring it up in this fashion under the auspices of this civil this report from the grand jury. 
Um, I wonder. Oh, if, I'm sorry. If I may, I did uh, hmm. another concern, and something that brings it up also. And I've given you each a copy of this article. Uh, is this ruling on FedEx and the IRS and so forth? Seems to me we have a perhaps a similar situation. I wonder if it would be. Um, could could you just review a couple of the, the quick highlights of where we stand right now with Director of Public Works? What the current plan is, as, as far as we know it. The, the contract was for a, uh, um, I believe it was approximately a two-year period. It is through the term of uh, June of 2008. Um, uh, there is a review stipulation within the contract uh, that has been done at the staff level. Um, the, uh, you know, if the council would like to uh, revisit that uh, contract at any time, uh, the council may choose to do so. Um, uh, so it's really a matter of whether or not you would like to see that contract on a, a future agenda. We, we, we have advertised an assistant public works director slash uh, a city engineer. That person uh, is on board working with us now. Um, you know, that at some juncture within the next budget, we will have to address issues with uh, that department moving forward as to whether or not uh, how much money we're going to dedicate towards contracting, how much money we're going to dedicate towards personnel services. So all of those are issues that I would uh, plan on bringing back to you. Uh, um, we'll probably touch upon it at mid-year. We'll certainly touch upon it with next year's budget. So at, at this point in time, June, June of this year is when the Parvis is due to retire based on the what we had discussed before. Is that right? Yeah, under under the current contract. Under yes. the current contract. Okay. I just wanted that clarification so everybody had at least that much information. Council thoughts or comments, please. If you'd like to talk, you know, we're we're getting and, and, and Matt's correct. We did talk about the the, the grand jury report and contracting, and uh, and whether or not we wanted to uh, revisit the contracting issue in some fashion. And so, really, the question is is whether or not you'd like to put. Uh, an issue on a future agenda to talk about the contracting issue and what I'm hearing is the contracting issue specific to the public works contract. And if the council would like to do that, uh, simply, you know, uh, advise staff and we'll put that on a future agenda. Okay. Yes, uh, Mark, question I would have uh, wouldn't be towards the, the position itself, but the, um, the type, the job uh, responsibility right now or, or the uh, basically what's on the plate of that person now. So my understanding would be they're, they're doing a cross-training, and there's also, you know, a list of to-dos that will take that person uh, up till June. I mean, but without adding anything else to the plate, in other words, how busy, how many projects do mm -hmm. we have to that, you know, takes that person? What's it look like in February, March, April, between now and June if we don't add anything to it? I, mean, I think you know, at some juncture here, we're getting to a point that we should have an agenda item. I mean, if, if we really want to get into that kind of a discussion specific okay. to the contract, the nature of the contract, the duties of the individuals involved, uh, I, mean, you know, I, can, I can assure you that when we do our – well, we haven't done our benchmark analysis yet, but I believe that you're probably going to uh, require – uh, either contract services similar to what you have now or an enhancement to those, either either with contracts or with personnel in your public works department. I mean, I can tell you that much right now. Uh, we'll report to you at mid-year. We'll do it again during the budget a year. Okay. Uh, it is, I think, atypical for a city this size with the nature of projects that we have to have a one-person engineering department. I mean, uh, We've done a phenomenal job, I think, with the limited staffing mm -hmm. that we've had within that department um, to date. And uh, but but I really do think that if we're if, you know you want to analyze that issue, we ought to put right. it on the so, agenda and talk. So about it. the scope of this is really just: is this something the council wants to agendize and discuss as changing what the current plan yeah, do, is? Which no, is? Do you want to yeah, do you want to do this now as a special item, or do you want to do it in the context of the normal budget process? starting mid-year okay. and then the, and really you. the issue. Thank you for that clarification. Well, I, I don't have any problem talking about contracting and, and uh, you know, it was on the tail end of that when we, were, when we started on our first two years here and we voted. Uh, the, the difficulty I have with the specificity of, of, of public works, whether it would be, and same thing I'd have if it was Mr. Survey or, 
or, or our, our council or anybody is we've got a we had a plan in place that that June thirtieth would be the end. Now if I was in that position or if I was in that area, I'd be shooting for June thirtieth so that the, the I mean there are things I'm sure that are on the on this page or that page or whatever that are planned out to be June thirtieth. So I would have difficulty whether it's a contract or whether it's an employee sort of diving into that and, and changing or some, eliminating a position or eliminating a, per, a person in that the fact that we've got a, I would assume, uh, you know, a benchmark situation where in March we're going to make sure this is done, in April we're going to make sure this is done, and in, 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 in May and so on and so forth, as opposed to all of a sudden saying, well, you're not here anymore. Well, but we had an idea of what we were going to work on the next three months. That's the, that's the difficulty I have with the specificity of it. I don't have a problem talking about the, the contract or the, yeah, you know, in general, of any of the departments. But I'm I'm a little concerned that we specifically say in one certain situation that we say, well, we're going to cut this off because we don't have a we don't have a plan. In my opinion, and maybe we do. Maybe staff does have a backup plan. I don't know. Pardon me. We don't know. Well, I don't know. If if staff has a plan in in place to back it up, great. I doubt it. I'm I'm you know of whether they do or not. That's the thing I worry about. So all of a sudden you have this void, and you say, well, how are we going to fill this? That's that's the thing I would worry about. My, if I may, Mr. Mayor, my point is that we've got this civil grand jury saying you're in the clear, and and in many regards we are. We we cleaned up our ordinances. We uh, you know our contracting with uh, planning has changed significantly. Um, our contracting for finance services is gone. Mm -hmm. The only thing we have left is this. The reason we're being so specific is because it's the only thing that's left. And I would just remind the council, we were told when we went the route that we did that we could bring this contract back for review any time we pleased. And in my opinion, both the grand jury report and the fact that we've got two new council members opens up the door to perhaps reviewing this contract. Well, I, certainly if the council would like to do that, I, w I would yes. honor that. This councilman feels that June 30th is, is the deadline, but in between, we talk about the generality and when we talk through budget or we talk through whatever, because we're going to have to fill the hole anyway. After June, as we all know, we're going to have to figure it with a contractor, with an employee, because you can't have a one, in my opinion, a one-person, you know, public works department. I think that would be, I don't think it would work. But I, I'm not sure this is the time to specifically get, but you're absolutely right that we can come back any time and discuss it if the, if the council decides that it wants to do that. Um, from my standpoint, we uh, we had a plan in place, and I think Councilmember Grocott, you're right. And they, what we built into that is we could revisit that or accelerate that if we felt that was necessary. But by we, the way I read that is the city manager's choice. Um, in other words, we gave him the flexibility that if he felt like we could move forward in a way that um, uh, we could, you know, move beyond the contracting situation that we have that and and we wouldn't have any sort of gap in service and he felt like we were ready to do that then my impression is that he would come to us and say hey we're ready we've we've got uh, in the case of the public works director we have somebody that we've hired in and we're ready to move on and that's the best thing to do at this point in time but what we said is by june of 2008 that would be the right time to do it so i i agree with vice mayor Grisselli that for me personally i don't feel like it's a time to necessarily say Hey, we want to revisit that. You need to do this now. I'm, you know, from my standpoint, I think there is the city manager has got this is an overview. He's got a plan in place, and he's going to work toward on his schedule when he thinks the right time to make that move is and make that suggestion. So, just again, from my standpoint, I'm comfortable with the plan that's in place, um, and I think the city manager has the flexibility to come back to us and, and move that forward if he feels like that's just in, in the best interest of the way the city works right now. So, that from my standpoint, it's not something that. I, um, I feel like we need to change. That's just my point of view right now. Um, uh, if anybody else would like to comment, then we should probably move on. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, just because I don't have the history mm -hmm. behind this, uh, whether or not the contract is actually discussed, I would be interested in just saying, okay, well, there is some sort of finality occurring in the Public Works Department in June. I would be interested in finding out what is the status of the department today, what is the succession plan, and the mix of contractors versus higher, I'd be curious to see what that is, how it's supposed to work, uh, and I'd prefer to have that discussion before June 
uh, when it's, to some extent, I feel like we've, one contract is over and I've got a gun to my head to say we've got to hire. Well, we're going to do that in the budget process. The budget yeah, process, that would happen approximately when? It's February 25th is when we're scheduled to bring back the uh, mid-year budget. Great. Any other comments? Yeah, and I'd just like to comment, uh, being this is uh, second planning commission meeting, I think there's two things going on. There's a city council. A city council meeting. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Uh, that uh, uh, first, I, I truly support Mark Weiss and, and his employment de decisions and what he's doing. I can't, I don't think I could be qualified to come in uh, next council meeting and, and make decisions and tell him how to do his uh, staffing. Uh, I'm comfortable with the June uh, time to, to look at this con contract and see what we're going to do. I definitely have, I have some real definite ideas on, on subcontracting, how it should be used, when it should be used, uh, and, and I'll voice those in, in June uh, when we get up to it. But to do something, I think, ahead of time would uh, – I don't feel that I would be qualified to even make those decisions, and, and I have a lot of structure <coughs> mark on his organization changes that I've seen him make over the past year, and, and let's keep going with it. And, uh, and then when this case comes up, we'll, we'll look at it. Mr. Mayor? Just a, a closing comment, if I might. Um, I, I would respectfully disagree with your position in just in that. Mm -hmm. I understand what you're saying. It's up to the city manager to manage the staff and we don't meddle in that. That's very true. However, with a contract, and this is where it gets a little murky and, and we can be unsure of ourselves, we have a contract. Even the, the new ordinances on contracting and purchasing, <coughs> anything over a certain value, that contract is up to us to decide how much it is, do we go forward with it, do we move on it, do we not move on it, and having moved on it, we enjoy the prerogative of bringing that contract back and reviewing it and terminating it at any time we wish. Mm -hmm. This is not an employee. This is a contract position. And, and that's all I was asking us to, to take a look at. Is, yes. and, and I would agree with uh, Councilmember Ahmad. I would rather do that before uh, we get there than, than wait till later. And apparently if, if what I'm hearing is we get a chance to do that Everybody. during the budgeting process, mm -hmm. so be it. Okay. Um, do we have a motion on item 6F? So moved. Second. Proceed. Councilmember Ma? Yes. Councilmember Grisilli? Yes. Councilmember Brokot? Yes. Councilmember Royce? Yes. Mayor Lewis? Yes. And with that, um, we're going to adjourn to closed session.